news. Daisy's listening, and you should too. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Very good afternoon. It's 12 noon. You're with the live desk here on GB News and coming up this Tuesday lunchtime. GB News sits down with the Prime Minister. Our political editor, Christopher Hope, asks Rishi Sunak the questions you want answering. We'll bring you the full interview right here on the live desk. The COVID questions continue. Just why were large-scale sporting events permitted as the disease ran rife across the UK? We're live at today's crucial stage of Baroness Hallett's key inquiry. And we're live from a BMA rally in Manchester as doctors call on ministers to end the deadlock or risk walkouts running into the winter. Speaking in the past hour, Health Secretary Steve Barclay says the BMA's leadership is not on the side of patients. And live and let buy. As Roger Moore's bond suits and props go to auction for charity, we'll be finding out why he truly has become the man with a golden gun. First, the latest news headlines with Aaron. Good afternoon. It's a minute past 12. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Businesses are demanding immediate clarity as confusion continues over the future of the northern leg of HS2. Rishi Sunak says a decision hasn't been made, but he's expected to scrap the line to Manchester at the Conservative Party conference tomorrow because of spiralling costs. However, the Times claims HS2 will now terminate at Euston in central London rather than at the western suburb of Old Oak Common. It's understood the PM will soften the blow by announcing other spending on infrastructure projects for the north. The government plans to ban trans women from female hospital wards. Under the changes, trans patients would be treated in separate accommodation. The Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, uh, spoke at the conference a short time ago. We will change the NHS constitution following a consultation later this year to make sure we respect the privacy, dignity and safety of all patients, recognise the importance of dialo different biological needs and protect the rights of women. Well, junior doctors are to hold a rally outside the conference centre in Manchester shortly. Uh, they have started a three-day strike in England, uh, along with consultants in their row over pay. Radiographers have also walked out. That's for 24 hours, so tens of thousands of patients won't be able to have scans. 
The BMA wants the government to return to the negotiating table and they've threatened new strike dates for November and December if a credible offer isn't received. Well, the government says uh, this year's pay rise was a final and fair settlement. Murderers who carry out sexually motivated attacks will automatically face a whole life sentence under new powers. The legal expectation on judges will apply retrospectively to those who've already been charged with the crime but are yet to be sentenced. Justice Secretary Alex Chalk says for the most dangerous and depraved killers, life really should mean life. Where that is the option that judges should be thinking about as an initial proposition, it now becomes the default, so it's what should happen, unless, of course, the judge decides there are exceptional circumstances. And we think that puts the law in the right place, that meets the instincts of the British people, and, as I say, does justice and provides, you know, a crumb of comfort uh, for families after the most appalling crimes that they feel justice is truly being served. The Home Secretary has accused some immigrants of not embracing British values and says they are living parallel lives to the rest of the country. On a visit to Bolton, Suella Braverman said they are coming from abroad, they are not learning the language and they are not taking part in British life. She added it is her job to be fearless in calling that out. A 13-year-old boy has admitted killing his grandmother in Sheffield. Uh, Marcia Grant died when the child, who was driving her car, hit her with the vehicle. The boy, who can't be named for legal reasons, was 12 at the time. He'll be sentenced in December after pleading guilty to causing death by dangerous driving. The 12-year-old boy is in critical condition after being struck by lightning in Hertfordshire. It happened during a football tournament at the Sella School in Hertford on Monday afternoon. The boy, who was from a different school, was taken to Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. A man in his 50s was also struck by lightning. Meanwhile, uh, lightning uh, hit a recycling plant in Oxfordshire yesterday, causing a huge fire. This uh, fireball lit up the sky when a gas tank exploded. It was at a food processing plant in Cassington. Uh, firefighters uh, tackled the blaze overnight and they remain there to monitor the situation. No injuries have been reported. Donald Trump has attacked a judge and a prosecutor on the first day of his fraud trial in New York. The former US president is accused of falsifying business records and financial statements to inflate his own fortune by as much as $2.2 billion. The Attorney General, Letitia James, accused him of lying about his property empire and overvaluing assets to get favourable bank loans. Trump hit back, saying the trial's a sham, Ms James is corrupt and the judge should be disbarred. He also made fresh claims of election interference. It has been very successful for them because they took me off the campaign trail. Because I've been sitting in a courthouse all day long. Instead of being in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, or a lot of other places I could be at. This is a horrible situation for our country. It's never happened before. It's election interference. They're interfering with the presidential election of 2024. And the people of our country see it. And if you've ever wanted to own a piece of film history, well, now may be your best chance. C-3PO's head is the original from 1977. Captain America's shield and the whip of Indiana Jones are all up for auction. It's part of the entertainment memorabilia auction in Hertfordshire. But you need your checkbook and you need plenty of money in the bank. C-3PO alone could set you back a million quid. But if you've got that to spare, then Hertfordshire is the place. We're on TV, on digital radio and on your smart speaker too. But for now, it's back to Mark and Pip. Yeah, don't look at us. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Thank you very much, Aaron. Now, the big question, what on earth is going on with HS2? Well, the Prime Minister has so far refused to confirm that he will scrap the Birmingham to Manchester leg of uh, HS2, despite widespread speculation that he will axe the project. He has, however, indicated that the cost of the scheme has gone far beyond what had been originally planned. Well, at the conference, of course, in Manchester, it's been suggested there may be an emergency cabinet meeting today ahead of the Prime Minister's key conference speech tomorrow, which may include that official announcement. Let's get more uh, with Catherine Forster, our political correspondent, of course, broke the news at the conference for us yesterday. This was under consideration. And, um, well, they sort of, uh, if you pardon the expression, try to cover their tracks since then, it seems, Catherine. 
Yes, I see what you did there, Mark. Welcome to Manchester. It's absolutely heaving in conference, which, of course, as I said yesterday, is in the sight of what was once a railway station taking trains, yes, from London to Manchester. You really couldn't make it up, could you? So it's super busy, as you can see this morning. We've had the health secretary talking about banning women from, uh, uh, sorry, banning trans women from um, single sex wards in hospitals. We've had the levelling up secretary not talking about HS2. We'll have Suella Braverman, the home secretary, this afternoon. The government would like to talk about lots of things, but all anybody is still talking about here is, yes, HS2. Not so much will it or won't it ever come to Manchester, because despite the government still insisting that no final decision has been made, it's widely expected, and I was told categorically yesterday, that Michael Gove has said it's being axed. Now, Apparently, the money is going to be repurposed, or some of the money potentially, towards roads and potholes, etc., and transport in the north, potentially northern powerhouse rail that we've heard about for many, many years, but it's never happened. You know, high speed rail running, connecting Liverpool through Manchester, through Leeds, etc., to Hull, up to Newcastle. Um, but some reports today that that may be under threat as well. Now, this has managed to unite people pretty much from across the political spectrum. Previous prime ministers, um, Boris Johnson, David Cameron, who rarely intervenes, uh, previous chancellors, George Osborne, been speaking today, saying what a terrible decision this would mean. The Labour mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, absolutely appalled, saying it will be a betrayal of the North if they pull the plug on this. And even the Conservative Mayor of the West Midlands, Andy Street. And bear in mind, this high speed rail is definitely going to Birmingham, though we don't know if it's going to end in Euston or Old Oak Common. He is saying, too, that it's critically important that this, connect, this line is built in full to Manchester and he's not going down without a fight. So uh, let's see what happens. Let's see. Tomorrow we expect the Prime Minister to make this announcement. What will he do instead? How is he going to sweeten this very bitter pill? If they pull the plug on Northern Powerhouse Rail, I honestly don't think they would dare. There would be absolute uproar. But um, I suspect there's going to be an almighty row, whatever. But for now, back to you in the studio. OK, Catherine, and, and just, uh, just one more question, actually. In terms of the MPs that you're talking to, is there not a lot of frustration that all this talk about HS2 is threatening to overshadow everything else about the conference? It is completely overshadowing the conference. The government has messages that it wants to get out. They're struggling to do that. And also, of course, we've had the prime ministers, previous prime ministers, Liz Truss, stealing a lot of uh, media attention yesterday with these messages from the sidelines about what she thinks Rishi Sunak should be doing differently. Now, of course, they say, don't they, that divided parties do not win elections. Rishi Sunak needs to try to present a united front. But unfortunately, although there are some MPs think, yes, they can still win the next election, Rishi Sunak's on the right track, the polls are beginning to close. There's many that think the election is already lost, they're jostling for position. People like Suella Braverman, Kemi Badenoch, Priti Patel, all really fancy being next leader of the Conservative and, Party. So and in the, really the sh quite a difficult time for Rishi Sunak. Yeah, and in the shorter term, uh, Catherine, we understand there may be an emergency cabinet meeting there in Manchester, rather than being held around the cabinet table at number 10. Does that indicate that there are concerns within the cabinet itself, not just at the decision, but the way it's been presented by the government? Well, there are, certainly are concerns within the Cabinet. We, we have heard that Mark Harper, the Transport Secretary, isn't very happy. Ditto Michael Gove, the levelling up secretary, who, who has told an impeccable source that it's not happening. But the thing is that Rishi Sunak does need the Cabinet stamp of approval to make this announcement. Now, there were rumours that Cabinet meeting might be held yesterday. It didn't happen. It may well be held today um, to rubber stamp this plan. But... Um, 
um, all eyes on HS2 and the irony of standing in an old train station in Manchester at a time where trains and Manchester are at the centre of a very big political storm. Catherine, uh, at uh, platform 13 and a half, uh, if we take that uh, analogy from uh, Harry Potter, thanks very much for taking us through that. Um, I think we've got some pictures coming in just yeah. to break away from Manchester because we're going from Manchester to Cardiff. Something completely different uh, for you. Some lovely pictures here of the Prince and Princess of Wales uh, visiting Cardiff as uh, celebrations of the 75th anniversary of the arrival of the HMT Empire Windrush to the UK get underway. And uh, it also, this marks the start of Black History Month. Now, it is the second visit of the Prince and Princess of Wales to Wales in just over a month, because uh, they were there last month to attend a service at St David's Cathedral to mark the first anniversary of the Queen's passing. And uh, there they are, getting a glorious welcome from youngsters in Cardiff yeah. this afternoon. All turning out in their best school uniform, <laughs> neatly pressed and washed, of course, but um, just reflect uh, Cardiff very much at the centre of that post-war uh, multicultural change in Britain, with Tiger Bay in particular uh, down on the uh, front there in Cardiff. Um, but William and Kate um, celebrating the work of the diverse community groups trying to bring about more positive change in Wales. And the flags fly, the cheers and a wave there from the Princess of Wales. I think that's been a bit of a hit, that visit by the sound of it. More from Wales, of course, as that visit continues throughout the day. Let's take you back to Manchester, though, and uh, Gloria De Piero, who is now joined by Conservative MP for Stroud, Siobhan Bailey. Sh Gloria, will Siobhan talk to you about HS2 you. and what the heck is going on? Thank you, Pip. Let's look ahead to the Prime Minister's speech tomorrow with Siobhan Bailey. Okay. You have got a majority of less than 4,000. You really need the Prime Minister to pull it out of the bag to keep... Stroud Conservative for you at the next election. What does he need to do, Siobhan? Well, listen, I do have a marginal seat. You know what that's like, I and do. it may, is even more marginal uh, with the boundary changes, actually. But I like a challenge. I was written off last time, so I'm, I'm really up for the fight. I mean, local people are going to have both myself and Rishi on the ticket in the election whenever that may come. Um, they've seen from me just really hard work, prag pragmatic, sent to London to change the law. I've done that on childcare. I've done that on anonymous abuse, online safety. I've done that on things like child maintenance enforcement so they can see that I'm taking difficult decisions and trying to make changes uh, and bringing that to make you know make things better for local people that's what I've really liked about what Rishi's been doing in the last few weeks. He's actually saying, look, I can, I've can. i got to take some really difficult uh, decisions. They're going to be unpopular, but I'm going to really explain to the public why they are necessary. So I want to see more f of that from him tomorrow. Uh, we, he made some really solid announcements, difficult announcements on net zero, but that will matter to absolutely thousands of people in my constituency in terms of the worries that they were having having about changing cars and where they're off grid and boilers and things. You know, I want to see some answers and some really solid uh, proposals on the what I would call the kitchen table politics. So what 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 is what is bothering people on a day to day basis? What where is the state getting into their lives and them seeing it's not quite working as well as we would all hope. So things like education, special educational needs. I'm having a big argument about reforming the apprenticeship levy because local businesses say that we want those changes, childcare, let's get the childcare uh, workforce. You know, there, there's so many things he can talk about, but I don't think tomorrow's speech is going to be the end of it. Okay. I really see energy, so energy bunny um, uh, from, from what the PM's doing at the moment. OK, and um, just to reflect on uh, Steve Barclay, the health secretary's mm. speech this morning, he said he was challenging wokery mm. uh, in the health service. Now, Theresa May, the former prime minister, said so yeah, she yeah. would be happy to be called woke. <laughs> Are you woke? OK. Tomorrow? OK. Well, listen, I, I think there's a lot of book selling going on at this uh, this particular conference, as there will no doubt be uh, at the Labour Party next week. Um, listen, I, I, that, 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 that label means lots of different things to lots of different people. I think what I do reject is where if you wade into an issue that people are worried about, for example, statues being removed, we have that problem in Stroud, and you make a case because you passionately believe in protecting history and you just want the, the, the item explained rather 
rather than removed and you get called racist and things like that, I think that you should be able to make that case positively and explain why you want to do it without being given a, a label. Uh, but I think probably uh, in Twitter I've been called worse things than woke <laughs> so far. Yeah. Very good. Um, last question. Yeah, yeah. You were a candidate, obviously, you were, you were a winning candidate at the last election. Just 24% of Tory candidates were women at the last mm. general election. Now, your party chair, Greg, Greg Hans, Chairman, yeah. Herman, as you would uh, describe him, he said he is concerned about the number of women being selected. He says he's looking at different ways to do something about it. Why aren't women standing and getting selected as Conservative MPs? Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm the first female MP for the Stroud constituency since it was created in its current form. That's mad. That is absolutely mad. There's great women locally, nationally, that could have had the seat before me. Um, women do need to come forward. I'm glad that the party chairman's talking about that on the floor of conference. Uh, I passionately do not agree with all women shortlists, which I know other parties do. I fought two big burly military blokes uh, to get Get my seat. I beat them hands down. They're both MPs in other seats at the moment. So I think um, we've got to be, uh, uh, we've got to win our seats on on merit. Um, but there, the back room work needs to be done. So the encouraging. We know that women uh, need to be asked a few times before they're actually put their application in. Whereas men will think, oh, I'd like to be an MP and then do it immediately. Yeah, so that, that that's evidence. That's right. So I think that back room work, that getting the pipeline of women who are interested, um, and, and you know, it actually falls to myself and. and people like you uh, that have done the job to say that it is achievable, it's achievable with things like families, I've got two small kids it's hard graft, it's a pain in the neck sometimes but I love the job and it, and it, is, a, it is something that I'd like lots of young women and women of all ages to come forward for. Well we always uh, enjoy having yeah. you on the show, Siobhan on the channel. Uh, we'll look forward like you to hearing what the Prime Minister yeah. has to say tomorrow. Thanks very much Thank indeed you. Siobhan Bailey, the Conservative MP for Stroud back to you in the studio for about 15 minutes and then I'll have a cabinet minister coming up for you soon. <laughs> OK, Gloria, we're, we're, we'll much. be timing you. Yeah. Thank you very much. We've got time for a quick coffee. Do stay with us here on the live desk with your coffee because we will be live from a rally in Manchester as the health secretary says that uh, BMA leadership is not on the side of change and not on the side of patience. You're with GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the smart speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps.
From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's. On GB News, I'm GB News Radio. At Jubes & Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the live desk where we're going to take you back to Manchester, not for the Tory party conference. It is the latest in this continuing industrial action. NHS consultants saying they won't take any more strike action for four weeks, but only if the government gets round the table for negotiations. However, uh, Health Secretary Steve Barclay says the BMA leadership is not on the side of change and not on the side of patients. Medics are urging ministers to end the deadlock and to enter talks through the conciliation service ACAS to resolve the longest ever joint action by junior doctors and consultants in England. Well, the BMA is actually holding a rally outside the conference in Manchester. Our reporter Jack Carson uh, is there for us. And, uh, Jack, clearly we've got um, a huge gulf still where we, we had Rishi Sunak speaking uh, to reporters this morning uh, saying that the government had... Uh, tried time and time again to speak to the BMA and that hadn't happened and yet we've got the BMA saying look we've been trying to get to the government to get round the table and they're rejecting it. it it seems as if they can't even agree on disagreeing well, yeah, that certainly seems like the case, of course. It's well over 100 days now since Steve Barclay last met officially with the British Medical Association. And, of course, they very much would like him to come back to the table. And as you mentioned, Rishi Sunak has said that they have tried and, that, and, there's, and there's been attempts, of course, to work out how, a way, how, how there might be a way to stop all of these uh, industrial disputes, of course. There's been strikes in the NHS since December. The nurses, of course, uh, over a million of them now have uh, accepted uh, the government's pay offers. Also, then accepted those independent pay review bodies offer but of course here today there is this huge national rally for the British Medical Association essentially what they've done is that they've told everyone that might well be on a picket line across the country to get on one of the buses that they've provided and come here to Manchester we're surrounded as you can probably see around me by loads of hundreds uh, if not going on a couple of thousand orange hats that's certainly the expected numbers here when the uh, rally officially starts at around one o'clock this afternoon we're going to hear speeches from big uh, members, of course, big people, of, of, of doctors across the country, as well as, of course, officials within the British Medical Association. Of course, uh, Steve Barclay today in his speech making some important announcements, one of those, of course, on new medical schools in order to try and train more NHS doctors. That, of course, from the picket line I spoke to uh, Manchester Royal Infirmary yesterday and certainly from some of the placards that are here today as well. That's one of the messages that the people here in the doctors on strike are worried about. They're worried about the future of the NHS and where these newly qualified qualified doctors, uh, go, whether they're going to be retained within the NHS. So that certainly might well be welcome news from the British Medical Association, but I'm sure we'll hear from the speeches today a little bit more of their thoughts on that. The Prime Minister, Jack, speaking earlier, you know, was, was blaming the, the, the length of the waiting list purely on, purely on the strikes. But of course, there was already a backlog before these strikes started happening. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, 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 that backlog has only ever increased under the last 13 years of, of Conservative government. That, that is a fact. Of course, the pandemic did increase that dramatically. But, of course, Rishi Sunak saying that these industrial disputes are causing an increase to those waiting times. Of course, we know from the new data yesterday that over a million appointments since December have had to be rescheduled. But in new polling revealed yesterday, uh, of those, of course, waiting lists and who the public blames, 42% of people blame the government for those waiting lists. Only 
15% actually blame the doctors and nurses striking, although we have heard from hospitals across the country that some patients have had to have operations cancelled not twice but three times. So Rishi Sunak certainly um, looking to the BMA, of course, putting them as, their num as the number one reason why waiting lists have increased, but the BMA disagreeing that yeah. uh, constantly, uh, Phil Banfield, of course, is, is, is the chairman, constantly saying that, look, doctors don't want to be on strike and actually, um, you know, they want to be recognised as the skilled professionals they are and that Rishi Sunak shouldn't use the doctors as a scapegoat for his own government's problems. Jack, we can hear that they're in good voice behind you there in Manchester, of course, outside the, uh, the conference area. Um, you've clearly been talking to a lot of people there. Are you getting an indication that the, the junior doctors and the consultants are as one, that they speak with the same voice? Or is there a, a different appreciation of what they're having to go through? I think there's certainly an appreciation uh, uh, with the senior consultants that, that they're not necessarily that their pay isn't necessarily maybe top of uh, top of their agenda as a whole as a whole United fr uh, Front as this very much seems to be here today. But for the senior consultants, I think a lot of their worries come down to the future of the NHS. I mean, one of the doctors I was speaking to yesterday is worried about those levels of retention. For junior doctors, it's them, of course, having to study for so long yeah. and uh, increasing all those, of course, medical bills that they feel that their salaries aren't going far enough. So certainly there's different issues within uh, the two sides. But as you mentioned, uh, with the feeling that I've got here is this very much is a united front. OK. Uh, Jack, uh, thank you for updating us there in Manchester. Fast becoming, of course, our, our health correspondent, it seems. Thanks for updating us there. Now, uh, something completely different, a bit of light relief. And don't we all need it today? Uh, we have been expecting you, Mr Bond, or at least we've been expecting quite a lot of your suits. What was that? <laughs> Hundreds of items belonging to Sir Roger Moore are going up for auction tomorrow in London, with Bond fans queuing up to see if they can buy a piece of 007 film history and help one of Sir Roger's cherished charities. Well, the deputy chairman of the auctioneers, Bonhams, no less, has allowed us to spy on the preparations for a celebration of a man who truly now seems to have created a golden gun. So this year it marks the 50th anniversary of Sir Roger playing James Bond for the very first time in Live and Let Die. And uh, he died sadly five years ago and his family felt this was the right time to give his fans the world over a chance to bid on some of these lots. Well, there are so many unique items in this sale and from James Bond interest, I think for me, this coat behind me, which is uh, a Chesterfield um, coat that he wore in his first film, Live and Let Die. And in fact, in the very first scene, you see him coming out of JFK Airport wearing the coat and he gets in a taxi on his way to see the villain of the film, Mr. Big. Well, one of the most important lots in the sale is this James Bond Amiga Seamaster watch, which is a limited edition number, but it's actually unique because it was given to Sir Roger on the 50th anniversary of the franchise by Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson. And they are, of course, the producers of the Bond franchise. And engraved on the back of the strap, it actually says, to Roger, with love from Barbara and Michael. Well, I think everyone knows that Sir Roger Moore was a very keen skier and he's involved in two of the great ski chases in Bond, Bond history. This ski suit, I think, is just so iconic. It comes from his last film, The View to a Kill, and it's the opening sequence when he comes down the slope and he's chased by a bunch of guys with, you know, on skis with guns, and he skis, then he snowboards, and then he ends up in a, in a submarine at the end of it. The cabinet behind me has some really fun things from his 40th anniversary Swatch Watch collection in this wonderful 007 case. Um, we've got his wallet with um, his bank cards in it um, and a couple of backgammon sets as well. One of which, the one beneath here in the red leather case, he would play on set with Cubby Broccoli. I understand for high stakes and they would sort of settle up at the end of the series and if Cubby was winning, he wouldn't let Roger go back on set until they'd finished the game. So it's some great stories behind that and some great games played on the board, I imagine. Well, Sir Roger Moore played James Bond more than any other actor, seven times between 1973 and 1985. And in my opinion, he's the best dressed of all the Bonds. And here we have one of the most iconic dinner suits that he wore. And this is from The View to a Kill. 
He wore it in that amazing scene at the Eiffel Tower where he's um, chasing after May Day, placed by Grace Jones, and they go up and then down the Eiffel Tower. He's standing on a lift shaft going up and down. So the estimate on the suit is 20 to 30,000 pounds. And again, we'll see where this ends up on the day. But well, we're really, really excited about the sale. Um, there has been unparalleled um, interest and excitement the world over. It's been on tour in the States and also in France. And it's a very accessible sale because we've got lots at about £100 for a Corgi toy car, up to the big lots like his personal Amiga Seamaster watch at 20 to 30000 Of course, his wonderful James Bond suits as well. You didn't mention the Lamborghini skis. Can you imagine that? I've got a pair of Roger Moore's Lamborghini skis. And they'll skis. be the really long, old-fashioned yeah, ones as well. Great, yeah, great for being on the Wonderful. shoes. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, uh, do stay with us because we'll have more on this because we are joined by the head of 007 International Fan Club, David Black. Yeah, that's coming up uh, a little later. First, let's get an update on all the news headlines with Aaron. We've been expecting him to... And here I am. It is 12.33. Aaron Armstrong here in the GB Newsroom. Businesses are demanding immediate clarity as confusion continues over the future of the northern leg of HS2. The Prime Minister has refused to confirm if he'll curtail the planned line to Manchester. Despite widespread speculation, it will be axed. Uh, Rishi Sunak says the enormous cost has gone far beyond its original budget, but insists a decision is yet to be made. He's expected to make an announcement on the project at the Conservative Party conference tomorrow. The government, meanwhile, plans to ban trans women from female hospital wards. Health Secretary Steve Barclay told his party's conference the privacy, dignity and safety of all patients needs to be respected. He also said it's important to recognise different biological needs, protecting the rights of women. Under the changes, trans patients would be treated in separate accommodation. Junior doctors are currently demonstrating outside the conference centre in Manchester in their long-running dispute over pay. They, along with consultants, are on strike until Thursday. Radiographers have walked out this morning. That's for 24 hours, so tens of thousands of patients will be unable to have scans. The BMA has warned fresh strikes will be scheduled for November and December unless they receive a credible offer. But the government says this year's pay rise was a final and fair settlement. And the Home Secretary says some immigrants are not embracing British values and are living parallel lives to the rest of the country. On a visit to Bolton, Suella Braverman said they're failing to learn English and are not taking part in British life, adding it's her job to be fearless in calling it out. I'll be back with more in about half an hour's time or you can get more now on our website, gbnews.com. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. At so Jubes & Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political budgets. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's watching. 
People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan Tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever, and that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan Tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel. It's easy to get lost in the drama of conference, it says here. Uh, but a key government decision did come into place on Sunday uh, that many have uh, had at the forefront of their minds. Yeah, the Windsor framework affecting the passage of goods from Northern Ireland to mainland Britain and the EU with red and green lanes is now in place. But will it solve the post-Brexit border issues? Let's once again cross to Conservative Party conference in Manchester and Gloria De Piero. Gloria. Hi, Pip. I'm joined now by the Northern Ireland Secretary, Chris Heaton-Harris. Thanks for your time today. Pleasure. Um, there's been lots of speculation about whether there's going to be a Cabinet meeting today to resolve this will-they-won't-they HS2 question. You're a Cabinet Minister. Yeah. Are you having a meeting today? Um, well, it's not in my diary, so either I've been fired without being told um, and there's a reshuffle going on, or maybe it's not happening, so I don't think it's happening. Secretary of State, there's been a lot of good announcements that could have come out of this conference, but it's been drowned out. So, you know, you've had your town's funding um, announcements, you've had your increase in the minimum wage announcement, but all everyone's talking about is what is going on with HS2. It's a bit unfortunate, isn't it, this indecision or this lack of um, transparency if a decision has been made? Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, there, there has been a lot of good news and the, 50, you know, the 55 towns getting to, uh, to, uh, 20, 20 million. million yeah. Um, uh, is, is yeah, really, I'm giving really you news. that, but it's been drowned out. Um, but, you know, there is, a, there is a conversation going on at this point in time. I mean, I, I work with Rishi Sunak on the winter framework stuff. I know how, he, you know, he, how considerate he is, how detailed he goes. He gets all the details. He considers everything. He's a very thoughtful man. He wants to make the right decisions in the long term for the country. And um, so he's not going to be bounced into making any premature decisions on anything. And I'm quite sure that... Um, if, if there's a conversation going on about HS2, he'll be considering it in the same way. And you mentioned uh, the new Northern Ireland trade rules. You said they'd work unbelievably well. Uh, today, the DUP MP, Sammy Wilson, says you're talking rubbish. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I don't think I am. Um, Sammy is a great man, and I, I, I appreciate his views, but I think he might be wrong on this one. And all people have to do is actually look at all the uh, lorries going about their normal business as they head from GB to, into Northern Ireland or from Northern Ireland into, uh, back into Great Britain to, I think I can demonstrate my point. The left-wing magazine, the political magazine, The New Statesman, they've had um, a list of the most influential people on, on the right in, in British politics. Yeah. Rishi Sunak is not 
taken the number one spot. He's actually been ranked as number two. The new statesmen say Nigel Farage is the most influential politician or on is the it right. Living politicians, because otherwise, live it, live it. Be, oh, thank God for that. <laughs> um, well, then, I, I, well, I mean, I, I was a member of the European Parliament with Nigel Farage, and um, we campaigned on the same issue, Brexit. Conservative Party is the issue is the is the party that delivered Brexit. So, um, as one of your fellow presenters, maybe he's just here um, for a party that actually gets on and does the right thing. Liz Truss is, of course, making a, a bit of a splash. She had that sort of packed out meeting yesterday. Sixty of your MPs, Conservative MPs, have joined this new Tory faction on, on growth. Yeah. Why does there need to be a, a separate faction, a separate Conservative MP grouping on, on growth? There's interest groups on just about everything in, in all the parties. I mean, I'm pretty sure you'd have been, when you're a Labour MP, you're a part of a, a, you know, a different faction or two, um, as it were. I don't even see them as factions. They're, they're just interest groups that come together. Uh, we bond around different things. And I was chairman of the European Research Group, um, a group of people uh, from all wings of my party that are interested in our relationship with the European Union. So um, it doesn't mean... You're relaxed. Anything. You're I, relaxed. I'm completely relaxed about that, yeah. OK. Give us a sneak preview, then. Rishi Sunak, Prime Minister, he's going to wow the conference hall. The country is what you hope. How is he going to do it? Yeah, well, I think he's going to talk about his long-term vision for the country, that he's going to take the tough decisions, as we've demonstrated over net zero. And he's got this country's best interests at, at the very heart of everything he is doing. And as I say, I work with him on the Windsor Framework. I, I, I know what Rishi Sunak can do. Um, he's a great politician. He's very thoughtful. He will get these decisions right for us. Chris Heaton Harris, Northern Ireland Secretary, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Pip and Mark. Gloria, thank you. And apologies if uh, you spotted the idiot in the background making some rather unsavoury uh, gestures to camera there. Yeah, uh, beyond our control, I'm afraid, because obviously we have uh, got our uh, stage there, but uh, clearly people are able to come and go as they please at conference, so our apologies uh, for that uh, uh, intervention there in Manchester. Let's bring you some breaking news we're getting from Press Association, reporting that the planned strikes by London Underground staff uh, due tomorrow and Friday have been called off, according to the RMT union. No word yet, though, on the train action uh, with Aslift, the train drivers union, of course, uh, threatening action tomorrow as well. Yeah, they are timing the walkout to coincide with uh, the Conservative Party conference. Uh, maybe we will hear something from them today, but so far the RMT are saying that their strikes, which are by London underground workers tomorrow and on Friday, they are not now happening. They've been called off. Uh, now, the Prince and Princess of Wales uh, are in Cardiff celebrating the 75th anniversary of uh, HMT Empire Windrush uh, arriving in the UK and also marking the start of Black History Month. William and Catherine are visiting Cardiff to meet members of the Windrush generation and celebrate the work of diverse community groups trying to bring about more positive changes in Wales. Well, let's get more with our Royal Correspondent Cameron Walker joining us in the studio and reflecting that we saw some pictures there with some very excited oh, school so kids. Yeah. Lots of cheering, lots of flags, a bit of a hit. They certainly are. I mean, they're almost celebrities, really, aren't they? People scream and cheer when they see the Prince and Princess of Wales or indeed any member of the royal family, really. We do, we do expect them, of course, to do a bit of walkabout. You can see the Princess She's of Wales She's got a real there. affinity with kids, though, hasn't she? Yeah, she certainly well, does. Well, she has got three young ones. It, well, this is true. <laughs> well, she has three young ones, but also it's her passion talking about the early years and mm. children zero to five and, and how that can affect um, your chances later on in life. You can see how, you know, kind of comfortable they are chatting to yeah. children. But I'm noticing a pattern with the Prince and Princess of Wales over the last few months. And it's the fact that they keep going back to Wales. And obviously the clues in the title, Prince and Princess of Wales. But there's, I'm getting the sense from Kensington Palace that there is a real drive to really get the Welsh people and different Welsh communities to trust and engage with the future King and Queen. So I'm told that they really want to deepen the relationship with Wales by understanding different communities and want to act as ambassadors for its people and communities. So over the last six months, let's say, they have been to uh, Aberfan, where the, uh, it, the village in Wales, where yes, that tragic yeah, um, yeah. fell down and, and engulfed a school. We've, they visited the search and rescues teams at uh, Benibra Heliog National Park. Prince William has been to the Welsh Senate. Um, of course, they chose to spend the anniversary of the death of Queen Elizabeth II in Wales mm. as well. Yeah. And now they're here celebrating the Windrush generation. Yeah, in and Wales it's, it's interesting for Cardiff because we've got yeah. 
yeah. Tiger Bay, which is one of those areas where that post-war generation who came in from uh, elsewhere in the Commonwealth and the Empire, they, they settled there on, on the, the waterfront in Cardiff. Yeah, 1948, so the Caribbean communities came over yeah. to Britain to essentially rebuild it following the Second World War. And the whole point of the Windrush 75 is really celebrating the contribution that those communities and their descendants mm. have made in national life, particularly in Wales. Of course, you've, you've, you mentioned uh, that bay there. The Grange Pavilion, the Prince and Princess are visiting specifically, and it's an old bowls club that's been converted into a community centre which, which, which really serves these communities uh, in particular. It's got a cafe, but also employment and training opportunities for young people. I understand the Prince and Princess will be spending time with elders who perhaps remember the wind, wind rush happening in the 1948 and, and 50s, but also young people a couple of generations down the line. And the kind of opportunities that those young people have in Cardiff uh, in terms of employment and training to really get on in life. So the, the Prince and Princess are really shining a spotlight here uh, on this particular community in Cardiff. Um, let's also remember that they did live in Wales, didn't they, during the early years of, his, of their marriage? Yeah, yeah in, well, in Anglesey. That's right, in Anglesey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they did. So we, we believe Prince George spent a bit of time there. They tried to get away from the cameras when Prince George was very, very young and was just born um, away from London. They really enjoyed spending time there. Prince William was a search and rescue. Yeah, warrior. absolutely. Right, right in the middle of it. Yeah. As well. So they really do have a deep connection with Anglesey. But of course, this is Cardiff. And they knew that one day they would become the Prince and Princess of Wales. And this is the proof in the pudding. They want to keep coming back and engage with wealthy communities. Yeah. And we're likely to see... King and Queen a little later as well. Am I um, king, jumping certainly. the gun? Or no, we can we can say you, we will hopefully see some pictures of the King. He has been out and about in Aberdeenshire today. I'm not oh, going to right. reveal so just yet what he's a bit, doing. A bit further north. Uh, yeah. A bit further north. <laughs> yeah, it's understood he's staying at Burke Hall. Um, I'm not I, as far as I'm aware, we're not expected to see the Queen today, but I'm sure okay, there'll be right. other engagements. Soon. Well, we, we'll drag you back in the studio for that a <laughs> little later, Cameron. Thanks, thank you. Someone. A key second phase of the COVID-19 public inquiry launches today with the chair, Baroness Hallett, saying families who lost loved ones during the COVID-19 pandemic will not be ignored. Well, the latest we have is that Rishi Sunak has told the inquiry he's unable to provide his WhatsApp messages from his time as Chancellor during the pandemic as he's failed to back up those uh, messages. Well, let's uh, speak now to Charles Pressinger, who lost both mother and wife within six weeks of each other in 2021 after they both contracted the virus. Thanks very much indeed for, for joining us once again. I know you, you've shared your story with us on, on GB News very often, but clearly the, the Baroness, the chair, is saying that you know we need to learn more details for you and others about what was done at this very early stage of the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's vital that we do learn the lessons. Um, I think an uh, important part of that is allowing more brief families and the people who suffered the worst impacts of the virus to actually have voices in the inquiry. I want your voice to, to say, because clearly in terms of the, the inquiry itself was to learn lessons and make sure if anything, God forbid, happened again, the government would be better prepared. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's vital, you know, that the brief families' voices are part of that process. Uh, without our voices, those lessons will never be fully learned. I think it's important that the inquiry listens to the families and those people infected, uh, uh, impacted the most by this virus and this pandemic. Charles, one of, one of the uh, things the COVID inquiry will be looking at is those sporting events which took place in March, just as COVID was, was, start, was running rife in, in parts of Italy, for example. I think mm. they'd just started a, a lockdown in northern Italy. And yet these huge sporting events, the rugby was taking place, uh, there was horse racing, tens of thousands of spectators. When, when you look back at that period, were you stunned that those events were still going ahead? I was absolutely mortified at the time. I knew that it would actually lead to more of a disaster, more deaths, more people suffering, uh, the long-term effects of COVID. Yeah, it was absolutely reckless on the behalf of the government. Um, I don't feel they took the medica medications uh, appropriately and um, they didn't take the steps to protect the country or the people. You know, we knew social distancing was a huge part of this and basically what they did is 
encourage crowds to gather in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, it's totally reckless. And is, is there any way that you can understand their behaviour in that they perhaps did not fully appreciate what the scientists were saying? That, you know, you get scientists warning, but until you obviously see it taking place, it's very difficult to take on board. I would suggest that, yeah, they didn't understand. I, maybe they didn't listen to some of the scientific advice they were given. Yeah. Um, I think there was a lot of financial concerns that come above the well-being and health of the nation. Um, and I think that's basically led to the tragic place we are today. And as this inquiry goes on, Charles, do you, in a sort of strange sort of way, find it quite, quite a comfort, quite cathartic for you three years on? I think it's important to, to find out the truth, to learn the lessons we need to learn. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to do better in the future. You know, whether people like it or not, there are going to be more pandemics coming in the future. We're still in the middle of a pandemic, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. And, you know, the messaging from the government and media still isn't really on point, and it needs to be improved on. Uh, hopefully, that's something that the inquiry will highlight in the future and will do better in the future. Charles, I hope you don't mind me asking you another personal question because obviously when we talk about these things it becomes sometimes a bit of an academic exercise. I just wanted to ask you how you're doing and how things are. Well, I'll be honest, it's frustrating. It's an uphill struggle. Um, I hope we've planted the seeds to create a better future for all of the UK. I hope uh, the inquest will learn the lessons and do better in the future. Um, personally, I still have hope um, and I won't stop fighting for the families that deserve the answers. And that's what keeps you and others going, I guess. Sorry? I, said, I, said, I guess that's what keeps you and others going. Well, yeah, we have to do better at the end of the day. I think the whole country deserves better than what we've seen. Um, you know, hopefully this is a step towards a more open, honest society yeah. um, where the public gets to learn the truth, you know. We deserve the truth. Charles, as ever, thanks for sharing uh, your, your thoughts and your story with us on GB News once more. Thank you for your time. Stay with us here on the live desk when our political editor will be sitting down with the Prime Minister. You're with GB News. Hello, it's a blustery, showery day. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. I'm Alex Burkill. If we start off looking at the bigger picture and there is an area of low pressure just to the north of the UK and tightly packed isobars indicate that it is going to be quite windy, breezy for many of us. Meanwhile, high pressure is building from the south and that is going to quieten our weather down across southern parts this week. Through the rest of Tuesday though, yes, it's breezy and there are plenty of showers around. Some sunny spells in between the showers, but particularly towards the north and west of the UK, those showers could be quite heavy at times and there may be some rumbles of thunder mixed in as well. Temperatures are going to be down a little bit compared to recently. It's going to feel quite fresh at times, especially in those brisk, blustery winds. Through the end of the day, we'll continue to see some showers, particularly across northern and western parts. Some clear skies developing down the east and in the south as well. Meanwhile, as we go through the night, we are going to see a swathe of wet weather pushing its way in from the west, affecting many parts of Scotland. Some heavy rain likely here. Temperatures aren't going to drop a huge amount for many towns and cities, though some rural spots towards the east where we get the clear skies could turn a little chilly. So Wednesday then, a bit of a north-south split, a fairly wet picture across many parts of Scotland, quite cloudy. The rain will be heavy at times and building up with some high totals, particularly for western parts of Scotland. Meanwhile, a drier picture further south, albeit there will be a few showers to watch out for, particularly across parts of Wales and southwest England. Temperatures for many will be similar to today. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel.
Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus, on the smart speaker app, and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Very good afternoon. It's uh, one o'clock. You're with the live desk here on GB News and coming up for you this Tuesday lunchtime. In a few moments, we'll be hearing from the Prime Minister. Our political editor, Christopher Hope, asks Rishi Sunak the questions you want answering. We'll bring you the full interview right here on the live desk. Also, the COVID questions. Just why were large-scale sporting events permitted as the disease ran rife across the UK? We're live from today's crucial stage of Baroness Hallett's key inquiry. Plus, we're live from a BMA rally in Manchester as doctors call on ministers to end the deadlock or risk walkouts running into the winter. Speaking earlier, the health secretary says the BMA's leadership is not on the side of patients. Good afternoon. The Conservative Party conference is being dominated by questions over the future of the northern leg of HS2. But there are other pressing issues for the Prime Minister to deal with if he's to convince voters that his party is worthy of winning another term in government. Well, earlier the Prime Minister spoke to our political editor Chris Hope amid, of course, that conference threatening to be derailed by the issue of HS2 uh, and the reaction of former Tory Prime Ministers too. But Rishi Sunak spoke on a variety of issues, including whether he'd welcome... Nigel Farage is a Conservative MP. What do you stand for? 
I stand for doing the right thing for the country in the long term, not taking the easy way out. I think that's the change that people want to see in their politics. That's the change that I'm going to bring. And you mm. saw that with my decision on net zero. Mm. Uh, I did something that I thought was right. You know, it was a big decision. And look, people could criticize me for that, but I thought what we're yeah. doing, the path we're on, is going to cost ordinary families five, ten, fifteen thousand pounds. I didn't think that was right. We can hit our targets without doing those things. So I went out and set out a new realistic approach. And that's what you're going to see from me. That's the type of leadership you're going to get from me, because that's how we're going to change not just politics, mm. that's how we're going to change our country for the better. You mentioned net zero there. In that press conference last week, you said that a lack of consent risks support for net zero. Why not give MPs a vote? They never voted before net zero, have they? Well, actually, MPs do vote on these carbon budgets, which decide how much we're going to reduce carbon emissions. And one of the things I pointed out in my new approach to net zero is we've got to be more transparency around that when that vote happens again in the future. So when I said very clearly, when MPs vote on the amount of carbon reduction that we're going to do, alongside that, they should be considering mm. all the measures that are required to deliver that carbon reduction. That's the kind of honesty and transparency that politicians should yeah. have with the country. I didn't like this kind of Westminster consensus that all this stuff was being cooked up over here. People weren't being open with the country about what was required. I wanted to change yeah. that. And look, and as you could see, there were people who criticised me for the decision Decision I made, but I'm going to do what I believe is right for the long term of this country. I'm not going to take the easy way out. That's my approach to leadership. Okay. This time last year, you weren't Prime Minister, you are now. How does it feel to be at a conference when most members didn't vote for you? No, I, I'm the conference, the spirit of conference is great. You know, mm. I've been out and about talking to members, talking to colleagues. People have a spring in their step. They can see that we're making progress. When I first became PM, I set out five immediate priorities to focus on. Halving inflation, inflation is coming down. Stopping the boats, really important. And the numbers this year are down by a fifth first time that's happened that someone's brought the numbers down. So look, those plans are working mm. and people are responding well to what we're doing. New approach on net zero, increasing the national living wage for two million low paid people. Today, Jade's yeah. law, making sure that awful criminals who murder their partners don't have any rights mm. over their children. That yeah, obviously okay. is not common sense. We're changing that. And crucially, supporting people in towns. More people live in towns in our country than live in big cities to get all the attention from Westminster politicians. I'm changing that. We're giving people in towns, 55 towns across the UK, okay. a billion pounds long term funding and putting local people in charge of how to spend that money. So look, there's it's lots great. of good stuff going on. Good stuff. Is it right though on tax that nurses and teachers will be paying the higher rate of income tax by 2027 on current uh, forecasts? Look, I, I'm a conservative. Everyone here at this conference wants to see taxes yes. come down. Of course we do. So That's when? What we when is the, question, well, look, the best the best tax cut I can deliver for people is to halve inflation. Mm. It's inflation that is making life difficult for nurses, for teachers, yes. for everyone else that you talked about. Yes. And that's why the first of my five mortgage? priorities have, is to me. halve inflation. Have you ever had a mortgage yourself? Yeah, though? Of course I have. And, and, and it's exactly why I want so to you feel ease the, the burden on people's mortgages. How do we do that? If we restrain inflation, then interest rates can stop going up and start coming down, right? Mm. That's straightforward economics, right? Mm. That's the best way for me to help people. Mm. And the plan is working. Yeah. When I came into office, inflation was at 11%. But we are getting it down. The last few numbers show that the plan is working. And just as Margaret Thatcher did, just as Nigel Lawson did, those are proud conservatives. I'm following in their tradition, get inflation down, because inflation is the evil that we must defeat, and good things will flow from that. At the weekend, three cabinet ministers, your colleagues, said that ECHR withdrawal should be on the table. Is it? Well, what all of us are completely agreed on is that stopping the boats is a priority. That's why one of my five priorities is to stop the boats. We're doing a lot of things to bring that about, and I really want all your uh, viewers to know this. For the first time since small boats become a thing, the numbers are down this mm. year. Let me just say that again. Yeah. They are down. Yeah. They are down by a down fifth. By fifth. Yeah. Right? That hasn't happened anywhere else in Europe. They're down because of all the things we're doing. The new deal I signed with Albania. We've returned almost 3,000 illegal migrants to Albania. And you know what? They've stopped coming. Yeah. That's why we need to get Rwanda up and running. Now, I am confident that the plans we've got in place will work. They will deliver. They've got a lot to do. Of course we've got a lot to do. But this is a huge priority for me. And we're making a difference. Will you ever stop the boats? As I said, look, for the first yes, time ever, will. for the first time ever, the numbers are down. Yes. They are down by a fifth. That didn't happen by accident. Mm. That happened because we're doing a bunch of things. New Deal with Albania, tackling crime gangs mm. in, uh, upstream in different parts of Europe. Look, my view on this is simple. It should be the British people who decide who comes to our country and mm. not criminal gangs. And do you know what? I talk to other European leaders a lot when I'm out and about. They're increasingly seeing that too. 
The conversation on this in Europe has changed. When I set out my stall on this eight months ago, again, lots of people criticized me, but what you're seeing now from lots of other European leaders is an acknowledgement that what I said is right. They are all recognizing that it needs to be our countries that are in control of who comes to us not gangs, and we need to have systems that make that possible. So as I said then, where Britain leads, others will follow, and you're seeing that that is now happening. You may have noticed Nigel Farage is wandering around your conference, first time in decades. Would you have him back as a member of the Tory party? Now, uh, the, the Tory party is a very broad church, right? I welcome lots of people who want to subscribe to, our, ideas, to our values, right? And look, and the, the thing I care about is delivering for the country, and the more people, as I've seen at this conference, we've got record attendance, I think, at this conference, lots of energy, lots of engagement, people are responding well to what we're doing. We're making the right long-term decisions for the country. We, we want to bring change. That's what I'm about. The contrast with Labour could not be clearer. You've got Keir Starmer, who, you know, no one knows what he stands for, flip-flops left and right. The country can see through that. That's not leadership. What I'm offering is different. I know people want change. I'm the person to deliver it because we're going to do politics differently. You saw that on Net Zero. You'll see that this week. That's what you get from a Conservative government. Paris, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mm, so what did you make of that? The Prime Minister claiming that his leadership will be characterised by long-term decisions and the Conservative Party's broad church approach. Also high on his agenda was repeating that halving inflation is the best tax cut his government could deliver. But, of course, all eyes and ears will be on his set peach speech at the conference tomorrow, with the news agenda being dominated by that issue of HS2 and what the government may or may not do. Well, our political editor, Christopher Hope, joins us once more from Manchester with another interview, it seems, Christopher. <laughs> Hello, Mark. Hi, hi Pippa. Yeah, that was fa fascinating, wasn't it? We, we kind of stood away from HS2 in that chat because he's, he's been asked endlessly about that all morning. No news there, maybe more tomorrow. But I thought it was fascinating to hear him talk there about the issue of consent and whether people, MPs should vote on this idea of watering down these net zero targets. That, for me, is a complete trap for the Labour Party. If he can get a vote on the plans he announced to, in, 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 in Number 10 Downing Street a few, a few days ago, he will then force a real divide line with the Labour Party. Labels, Labour, he'll, they'll be saying, the Tories will say that Labour want to uh, ban these new uh, petrol and diesel cars in 2030. With the Tories, you can buy them until 2035. I think a fascinating new dividing line. And at the end there, interestingly, I, I, our colleague at GB News, Nigel Farage, back at this party conference for the first time in 30 years, I said to the throwaway line, would you like to join, would you allow Nigel Farage into the Tory, Tory party? Expecting a no. He said, we're a broad church. Extraordinary. And with me now is that man himself. <laughs> what a great question, Chris. Well, I mean, before <laughs> I arrived here yesterday, people were saying, would they even let me in through the front door? <laughs> now you're saying, would he let me in the party? Um, would you, no, yes or no? Come on, well, okay. well, well exclusive. What party? Will would you I, join it? Would I want to join a party that's put the tax rate up to the highest in over 70 years, that has allowed net migration to run at over half a million a year, uh, that has not used Brexit to deregulate and help small businesses? No, no and no. But you're here as a journalist. You're here yes. talking about things. Yes. Join the Tories. Do things. Well, I tell you what, I achieved a lot more outside of the Tory party than I ever could have done from within it. Um, and, and actually, you know, what I'm seeing here are ideas that I've talked about. You know, from 2019, when net zero was passed into law without even a vote. Without a vote, Parliament, crucial. I've said the agenda's mad, it's unfair. If you're going to do this to us, we should have a referendum on it. Yeah. Um, I've been arguing about ECHR. It should yeah. have been part of the Brexit deal. So what I'm seeing, Chris, I'm seeing a wing of the Conservative Party who are now basically saying what I've been saying yeah. for many, many That's years. That's why they want you back in. And so, well, half the party, <laughs> half the party would love me in. The other half would blackball me. But look, at the moment, I wouldn't know what party yeah. it is. Yeah, I did ask him at the PM personally, do you want to have a referendum on Net Zero two weeks ago in the press conference? And he said we had enough referendums. I of mean, it was so, everyone was so scarred by the, by the one <laughs> you were part of. We've had enough of the people having a different view to Westminster. <laughs> I mean, would Brexit ever have happened without a referendum? The answer is no. And if we had referendums on net migration figures, on net zero figures, we would get very, very different answers. Yeah. And it's happening in Australia right now, yeah, yeah. where the Australian government have put forward a referendum that they're about to lose very, yeah. very heavily. The centre ground of public opinion in this country actually is a common sense view on most things. And I don't think our MPs, 
or most of our mainstream media have ever been more detached yeah. from public opinion than they are. Of course, today. this Prime Minister was not voted in by the members. He was voted not to be here, but he is here first time. I asked him about that, and he, was, he said, well, it's good to be here, and he sort of brushed it off. I asked him particularly also about the issue of ECHR uh, withdrawal, yeah. um, European uh, Convention of Human Rights. Now, three um, cabinet ministers said it would be on the table in interviews at the weekend. That means it's an agreed line by Downing Street. Yeah. If more than one says it is agreed, yeah. they'll fund you. He, he wouldn't go there. He then he said, d d d referred to the small boats issue and how they've cut the numbers over the channel by 20%. What's your view? Will the Tory party, or should they, should they in fact, fight on a, on a policy of withdrawal at the next election? On the small boats, by the way, it's only down about 18%. Mm. We've had the worst summer in years. It's all about weather. If it's we not as bad as last summer. Uh, the weather's been no because the weather's been so bad. Okay. That's why the last few days have been calm. We've had what 1,300 come in the last four days. So. I wouldn't buy any of that, not for one moment. Okay. In fact, yesterday, 500 came. But on ECHR withdrawal? On ECHR, the big one. Um, of course, uh, they will put forward, at the next election, we're going to renegotiate with the ECHR and give you a better deal. And if we don't get one, we'll withdraw. That's what they'll tell the British public. It's rather like Brexit. They won't go the whole way. But to me, yeah. to me, this should have been part of leaving the European institutions. And, and I, I tell you what, if we had a referendum on that, I know the result already. Do you see it as a second, the second part of that Brexit vote, vote? Very much so. Very much so. Brexit will not be complete, all the while we're under the auspices of that ridiculous court. Because now we're stuck with this Rwanda case being stuck in the well, courts. We saw this, didn't we? One judge. One so-called judge. An unknown, yeah. unknown judge. Unknown and probably not even legally qualified. Well, we, don't, we don't know that. Well, what we do know is most people on the European court are not judges, they're jurists. They're not even legally... As we judges. understand, judges in our country yeah, is different. A farce. And, and inflation, I also remember, had, have you had a mortgage? He has had one. I wasn't able to say, have you got one now? <laughs> Maybe not, given the, the homes he's got in LA, Yorkshire and London. He called inflation evil. That's a big word in politics. The evil we must must defeat. And would you well, call why doesn't he replace the governor of the Bank of England? Because when some of us were screaming, and Liam Halligan in particular, yeah, yeah. I was with him, yeah. We were screaming two years ago from the sidelines, inflation is about to run away, you need to raise interest rates. And Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, whose sole job yeah. for half a million quid a year is to control inflation, mm. said inflation is not happening. Mm. Then it happens. It's transitory. Yeah. And suddenly they start to put up the interest rates at the very moment when we shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. We, we, we have been very badly let down yeah. by the FCA when it comes to banking and by the Bank of England. Of course, Kwasi Kwarteng had the governor in his sight when he became Chancellor so. just over a year ago, and they all felt, went away from that. You see, Sunak plays safe with everything. Mm. You know, I mean, I mean, to his credit, he's probably got the best intellect of any Prime Minister for decades. Mm. I don't think he's a thoroughly decent, nice man. He is a decent man. There's no question about that. But does he have that killer instinct? That well, I'm needs? seeing more political stuff from him. I think this stuff, this, this, this vote on, on net zero will be a dividing line because the party will be able to do it in the next election. If These he, Labour MPs want you to not get out of it. If he's yeah. got the guts to do it. I mean, yes, yeah. I agree with you. I mean, it's political. It's good. I mean, even the traffic stuff, you know, 20 mile an hour zones and everything else, why didn't they stop the ULES extension? They could have done that. Mm. And well, in the, fact, the government's written to town saying how you're going to deal with it, how you're going to yeah. bring down uh, uh, you know, emissions in, in, in parts of the country. Yeah, yeah. So Force them all, almost. Yeah. So they're all over the place. They're all over the place. And I think whilst he has done some good things, talking about traffic, net zero, it all looks a bit reactive, Chris. Yeah, but I think, I think it is. But I think we are seeing, finally, a bit of kind of red, red tooth and claw something. from a, 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 a PM who's been, you know, for 10 months, quite operational, quite yeah. COO, not chairman, that kind of thing. But, but to overturn a 20-point lead, mm. right, it's down to 10 now, if yeah. you believe well, it that. Be out, it could be an outlier. Whatever. But to overturn that is going to need something very bold, very decisive, I just don't see that as being part of his personality. Rumours uh, in this big spoon, we're looking now into the speech tomorrow, rumours of, of, of a ban on vaping or the, the throwaway vapes. It's more big stuff. More bans. I mean, we, we heard Liz Trust yesterday, didn't we, saying stop banning stuff, yeah. be the party of not banning stuff. Yeah. I mean, this is, this, this is the most unconservative party 
government in history. Mm. They put taxes up, the state gets bigger, we get surveilled by cameras wherever we go. It doesn't reduce crime uh, mm. at all. Um, they remove our choice. Um, I'm sick of nanny big state governments. Yeah. This is not. But we've, we've weaned onto this it. This is by not this. a conservative government. It's a social democrat. They have had two big black swan events. Events that weren't a forecast, of course. COVID-19 and the war in, in Ukraine. Neither of which were forecast at all. That's 500 billion pound more yeah. cost this country. So they would say that's why we we can't do what you want to do on tax. Why the 5.3 million people of working age not working? Mm. That figure has rocketed. Yeah. Uh, uh, but anyway, Mark, are you, you're still there in the studio. Do you have a quick question? Well, yeah, indeed, because you're talking about uh, red tooth and claw, you're talking about politics, and of course, uh, he's been trying to get the agenda away from HS2, which has uh, dominated the, the sort of journalistic and, and um, noises yeah. off. Now, We've got Jeremy Hunt having spoken at a fringe event, Centre for Policy Studies, talking about the Conservative Mayor of West Midlands, Andy Street, who's been criticising the government. Now, Mr Hunt has said he's a fantastic mayor, but he's speculating what he thinks a decision might be rather than talking about what the actual decision may be. Now, this brings into question the way that the government's handled this whole issue of HS2 and how it's allowed, really, the agenda to be taken over on, on, the, on the rail line. What's happened? Well, as I understand it, Mark, what happened is, now, you and I are old enough to know how you deal with these issues if you're in government. You say it's a matter for the next fiscal event, the autumn statement in middle of November. But what's happening is because the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, is looking at what they plan for the autumn statement right now, HS2 is so big, that means the government must make clear to OBR whether the northern leg goes, goes ahead between Birmingham and Manchester. And because that choice must be made now in government, that that's why this debate is happening because it really is happening behind the scenes. Now, I was with the Chancellor last night. Yeah. He made very clear no, no choice is made on this yet, and that's why he can say today to Andy Street, don't do it. But the mood music is they want to scrap it, take £10 billion and link the whole Liverpool, Manchester, get that line worked out. But for me, looking at the politics of it, yeah. the government has spent billions, billions and billions tunnelling under the south to keep the views nice for southern Tories. They get to Birmingham and they can't afford to link the north. It is a disgrace, frankly, to the levelling up agenda. But Nigel, what's your take? It's remarkable, isn't it? Here we are in Manchester with speculation that the Manchester leg may not go ahead. Um, he can't answer a straight question. I wonder whether he has no answer yet. I wonder whether he'll even give an answer tomorrow in his speech. And it is appalling politics mm. to allow all the big stuff they want to say this week to be overshadowed by this. Personally, I've been against it right from the start. Um, you know, from Houston. Why is that? Because it's well, a matter of, of, of capacity, not, not just speed. Yeah. It's two hours, seven minutes from Houston to Manchester Piccadilly, right into the heart of the business district. Speed's not the issue. Longer platforms, more capacity, yes. But the real problem in the north, I, I drove once from Blackpool to Hull. It's almost impossible. Yep. And there was no train option. Yep. Getting east-west across the Pennines, yep. from Yorkshire to Lancashire, yep. that's where the well, money I, I, I put a family member on the train to, to, to on the northern line to Leeds yesterday, and it's an, old, it's an old diesel. It wasn't what you expect in the south of England, I've got to be honest no, with you. No, no. It's, it's not fair. No, no. For a fraction of the money, for a fraction of the money, you could link up big cities in the north of England. That makes far more sense to me. Yeah, we, make, no, I, but we, we might see something tomorrow. Yeah. I think they are stuck by this problem. They've got to deal with the OBR. They are making a choice right now and doing it in real mess. time. What a mess, though. That's a mess. Big issues here, Mark. Yeah, I, I, Chris, very quick question to finish with. We were being told yesterday that there might be an emergency cabinet meeting there in Manchester today. We understand that's not taking place. Is that your um, no. understanding there? That is it. I, th I think the speculation is running away with itself, as it can do in this big old railway shed yeah. at the part, uh, uh, in, 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 in here in Manchester. I think that's still the case. OK, Chris, and uh, uh, also your, your team there in Manchester, thanks for taking us through uh, that... Uh, well, keynote speech that we got um, ahead uh, and, and the interview there. Thank you very much indeed. It really is a runaway train, isn't it, HST? <laughs> Blimey. I, I was thinking about saying, well, I, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, we, we'll be uh, shunting it back in the yard fairly soon, no doubt. Coming up, could the price of your food shop be coming down? Our economics and business editor will be running us through the latest food inflation figures. You're with the live desk. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK 
and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel... Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel. Now, uh, we've been expecting you, Mr Bond. Uh, that's the line, of course, we remember from the films. Or at least expecting quite a, a few of his suits, because hundreds of items belonging to Sir Roger Moore going up for auction tomorrow in London. So Bond fans are queuing up to see if they can own, uh, or buy a piece of 007 film history and help one of Sir Roger's cherished charities too. The deputy chairman of the auctioneer's Bonhams has allowed us to spy on the preparations for a celebration of a man who truly now seems to have created... A golden gun. So this year it marks the 50th anniversary of Sir Roger playing James Bond for the very first time in Live and Let Die. And uh, he died sadly five years ago and his family felt this was the right time to give his fans the world over a chance to bid on some of these lots. Well, there are so many unique items in this sale and from James Bond interest I think for me this coat behind me which is uh, a Chesterfield um, coat that he wore in his first film, Live and Let Die. In fact, in the very first scene, you see him coming out of JFK Airport wearing the coat, and he gets in a taxi on his way to see the villain of the film, Mr Big. Well, one of the most important lots in the sale is this James Bond Amiga Seamaster watch, which is a limited edition number, but it's actually unique because it was given to Sir Roger on the 50th anniversary of the franchise by Barbara Broccoli, and Michael G. Wilson. And they are, of course, the producers of the Bond franchise. And engraved on the back of the strap, it actually says to Roger, 
with love from Barbara and Michael. Well, I think everyone knows that Sir Roger Moore was a very keen skier, and he's involved in two of the great ski chases in Bond, the Bond history. This ski suit, I think, is just so iconic. It comes from his last film, The View to a Kill, and it's the opening sequence when he comes down the slope and he's chased by a bunch of guys with, you know, on skis with guns. And he skis, then he snowboards, and he ends up in a, in a submarine at the end of it. The cabinet behind me has some really fun things from his 40th anniversary Swatch Watch collection in this wonderful 007 case. Um, we've got his wallet with um, his bank cards in it um, and a couple of backgammon sets as well. One of which, the one beneath here in the red leather case, he would play on set with Cubby Broccoli. I understand for high stakes and they would sort of settle up at the end of the series and if Cubby was winning, he wouldn't let Roger go back on set until they'd finished the game. So it's some great stories behind that and some great games played on the board, I imagine. Well, Sir Roger Moore played James Bond more than any other actor, seven times between 1973 and 1985. And in my opinion, he's the best dressed of all the Bonds. And here we have one of the most iconic dinner suits that he wore. And this from The View to a Kill. He wore it in that amazing scene at the Eiffel Tower where he's um, chasing after May Day, placed by Grace Jones. And they go up and then down the Eiffel Tower. He's standing on a lift shaft going up and down. So the estimate on the suit is 20 to 30,000 pounds. And again, we'll see where this ends up on the day. Well, we're really, really excited about the sale. Um, there has been unparalleled um, interest and excitement the world over. It's been on tour in the States and also in France. And it's a very accessible sale because we've got lots at about £100 for a Corgi toy car, up to the big lots like his personal Amiga Seamaster watch at twenty to 30000 Of course, his wonderful James Bond suits as well. And that's what you fancy, the watch. The Omega watch, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. You? It's, but it, well, it's the, it should be the Rolex, because I, I actually saw the Rolex he had in Live and Let Die, where, if you remember, it had a rotating bezel to cut through the rope. And the quality of the craftsmanship employed by the props people at Pinewood oh, is really? just extraordinary. Yeah, so, I mean, there really are works of art, a lot oh, of those things. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Anyway, oh, and uh, helping out UNICEF, of course, his charity that he worked for. Absolutely. Well. Brilliant, brilliant cause. It's going to raise thousands now. Uh, we're going to be talking to our own James Bond in a minute here at GB News because that is such a bad link. The cost of your weekly I shop. I think he's a bit of a villain myself, but there we are. <laughs> might be that. Let me try that again. The cost of your weekly shop might be that little bit cheaper, you'll be pleased to know, as food prices fall for the first time in two years. Yeah, just. Groceries down by 0.1%. In terms of the inflation for September, according to the latest figures from the British Retail Consortium, uh, let's speak now to our... Our own Mr Big at Manchester. Liam is there with all the facts and figures. Um, you did predict this, that things would get a bit easier uh, in terms of what we call input prices, in terms of raw materials and food and so on, but it's just a very small step, isn't it? I quite liked your James Bond link, actually, <laughs> Pip. I thought it was very apt, <laughs> given that I was the next person up on the channel. <laughs> I mean, come on! You just need to be okay. wearing a better suit, Liam. Oh. Then you'd be sorted. Oh. Oh. <laughs> nice bit of schmutter, this is. Crikey. <laughs> right, get on with it. So, to food, food price inflation. So, you'll, you'll remember, Pip uh, and Mark, that in August, inflation, the headline inflation came down from 6.8% to 6.7%. That was why the Bank of England was able to hold interest rates at 5.25%, having raised them 14 times in a row. But those August, those official Office for National Statistics numbers in August, within that headline rate of inflation, food price inflation was still 13.6%. So food prices were 13.6% higher in August this year than August 2022. The numbers that are out this morning, they're not official numbers. They're from the British Retail Consortium, which means they're authoritative, but they're private sector survey numbers. They're not official data. And what they show is indeed, we've seen the headlines, food prices between August and September fell by 0.1%, a tiny little fall, but at least it's a fall. But, 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 I hate to um, sound gloomy, but the annual figures, so September compared to September last year, food price inflation, it's up by 9.9%. Yeah. So there's still a lot of food price inflation in the system year on year, 
But month on month, we are now starting to see food prices come down from their peak. And that is good news for households, but there's a long way to go. Yeah, and, and another but, of course, you've been concentrating on the oil price. It's dropped slightly overnight, about 2%, I think, but clearly that oil and diesel price will feed directly into transport costs for food deliveries. You know, I've been speaking at lots of fringe meetings here in Manchester, Mark. That's where people get together beyond the main hall and they debate specialised subjects. And I get invited to talk about housing, to talk about the economy, to represent GB News with delegates and activists here. And this idea that the oil price could scupper this fall in inflation that we've seen in recent months and lead to inflation going up anew, that's now definitely entering mainstream debate. You and I and Pip, we've been talking about it for quite a few weeks now because the oil price is up sharply from June from around $70 a barrel to above 90 now. Mm. You're right, Mark, it's come down a little bit over the last couple of days, but we still have that OPEC exporters cartel led by the Saudis, helped by the Russians who aren't an OPEC member, but they're working with the Saudis. They're not pumping as much oil onto global markets as is being demanded, and that pushes prices up artificially. And that's bad news for import, export, import, uh, energy importing countries like the UK. So this is good news on food price inflation, but there is that problem of a rising oil price on the landscape. And if that oil price stays high and goes even higher, it means that in this inflationary episode we've been living through for the last year, this cost of living crisis, which seemed to be easing in recent weeks, it may not be over yet. And I say that, of course, with huge regret. Yeah. Liam, uh, thanks for taking us through that there at the conference. Uh, more from you a little later, of course. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> The, okay. man, the man with a very golden gun. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, do stay with us here on the live desk. We'll be bringing you more pictures from the Prince and Princess of Wales who are visiting Cardiff today, uh, meeting start school children. It is the start, of course, of Black History Month. First, here are your news headlines with Aaron. It's 1.33. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Battle lines are being drawn, with the Prime Minister telling GB News he's the person to deliver change to Britain. Rishi Sunak defended his record on illegal immigration, saying for the first time ever the number of small boats crossing the Channel is down by a fifth. He also reiterated his plan to half inflation and accused the Labour leader of being weak on his policies. You've got Keir Starmer, who, you know, no one knows what he stands for, flip flops left and right. The country can see through that. That's not leadership. What I'm offering is different. I know people want change. I'm the person to deliver it because we're going to do politics differently. You saw that on Net Zero. You'll see that this week. That's what you get from a Conservative government. Meanwhile, the Home Secretary says some immigrants are not embracing British values and are living parallel lives to the rest of the country. It comes as latest figures show more than 25,000 people have been intercepted crossing the Channel in small boats this year so far. At an event in Bolton, Suella Braverman said some aren't taking part in British life and she's promising to be fearless in identifying problems with integration. The Prime Minister's yet to confirm the government's position on the future of the northern leg of the HS2 rail project. Businesses are demanding immediate clarity following reports Richie Sunak is planning to scrap the line from Birmingham to Manchester. It's understood the Prime Minister will soften the blow by announcing spending on other infrastructure projects for the north in a speech tomorrow. The government plans to ban trans women from female hospital wards. Health Secretary Steve Barclay told his party's conference the privacy, dignity and safety of all patients needs to be respected, along with recognising different biological needs and protecting the rights of women. Under the changes, trans patients would be treated in separate accommodation. And that's it for the moment. More on our website, gbnews.com. I'll be back with more in just under half an hour. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Here's how the markets look right now. The pound will buy you $1.2075, €1.1527. Uh, the price of gold, £1,513.46 per ounce. 
The FTSE 100 is at 7,492 points. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for physical investment. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Yeah. Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. The Prince and Princess of Wales are in Cardiff to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the HMT Empire Windrush arriving in the UK and to mark the start of Black History Month. Well, William and Kate were greeted by some very happy cheering school children when they arrived at Grange Pavilion close to the city centre. Our Royal Correspondent with us in the studio, Cameron Walker, to talk us through uh, what were some pretty happy scenes, one has to say. Yes, quite a welcome from a number in the of valleys. school children, <laughs> children in the valleys and also their teachers getting really into it as well, trying to take photos on, on mobile phones of them greeting uh, school children. It's, it's a running theme I think we've had recently with the Prince and Princess of Wales of really making a point uh, of spending time 
time with different communities here. I, I just spotted there something really interesting where she gets down to their level. Yeah. Getting down on... I mean, that's quite interesting, isn't it? It's that's you know, a deliberate move to, to uh, really bring them uh, to, to a bit more relaxed sort of uh, approach. Yeah, every time the Princess of Wales has an engagement with children, she tends to bend down to their level. We know that the Princess has a real passion for early years and early childhood developments, uh, ages zero to five. So she really thrives when talking to mm. school children here. You can see that both of them uh, are spending time uh, greeting as many of them as possible. Of course, they're only there for just over uh, an hour, hour for, for an engagement su such as this. But it's really... We, we've seen them in Aberfan six months ago. We saw them spend time with search and rescue personnel in the Benai Brecheniog National Park, if I pronounced that correctly, Mark. Yeah, please correct, yeah. <laughs> correct me if I haven't. Um, Prince William's been at the Welsh Senate, the Welsh Parliament in Cardiff as well. And they chose to spend the anniversary of the Queen's death in Wales as well. And this is the latest in a long line of engagements. But this, of course, focusing on, on the Windrush generation. Mm. 75 years this year since that first ship came across in 1948. Caribbean uh, communities rebuilding Britain post-Second yeah, World Tiger War. Yeah, Tiger Bay being one of those first communities in, in Cardiff there, down at the docks. Absolutely, and this is where the Grange Pavilion is, which is where they are visiting. They're visiting uh, elders there who, of course, probably remember some of the, the, the Windrush generation and, and what they did there, but also the next generation, young people who are are supported uh, with different training and employment opportunities there as well. So really meeting a range of people. And just while we see those lovely pictures of them greeting the children, I've just seen some extra detail where the children weren't told until 10 o'clock this morning that they would be singing for the Prince and Princess oh, of Wales. Oh, really? Can you imagine? <laughs> I know, that's quite a responsibility, isn't it? Yeah, of course, these visits are kept under wraps mm. for uh, security reasons, particularly if it's a big crowd such as this. And they would have only been told very last minute, which perhaps adds to the excitement uh, of, of the school children. We've seen the Prince and Princess of Wales a lot over the last year. We've had some huge royal events with the Platinum Jubilee of the late mm. Queen, uh, her, her death, and, of course, the King's coronation as well. So they'll be very familiar faces to these children. And it's, it's interesting to, to look at the... Informality, perhaps, is, is the wrong phrase, but the relaxed way that they can carry out these duties now. It, it is a different approach, isn't it? It is a different approach. They are the next generation of royals. It's a modern way of, of being members of the royal family. But I think, to be honest, this is Prince William, certainly, taking after his father, the king. Yeah. Because if you notice the king on engagements such as this, he as well, very at ease with talking to ordinary members of the public. And shaking and hands. And yeah. shaking hands. Yeah. And even when he's perhaps slightly in danger, if you remember last... Last yeah. year in York, one of his first walkabouts be since becoming king, eggs were thrown at him. You were there. I was there. Yeah. I saw those yeah. eggs being chucked. Yeah. But an hour later, he insisted on carrying out another walkabout to show he's not afraid and he wasn't going to disappoint the mm. public. And he, and he carried it out without any eggs. For these instance. things. But, you know, it does run in the family because Prince Harry is also excellent at this sort of thing as well. Prince William is, yes, but Prince Harry is, is too. We saw you him know. at the Invictus Games, And they probably we? get it from their mother. Yes, I'm Princess sure. Princess Diana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she certainly did, yes. Anyway, great scenes uh, there. And um, ju just to sort of reflect that perhaps we will see more and more of them in Wales as, as they undertake the official duties as, as prince and princess? Yes, yeah, so and from my understanding, they really want to deepen the relationship they have with different communities in Wales, particularly understanding these different communities, which is why we've seen such a diverse spread of engagements over the last nine months or so. And I'm told they want to be ambassadors for its people yeah, and communities. Yeah. Of course, a role they're always expected to have when Charles became king and they're going to do so uh, until, until the time comes when they take the top job. These are the latest pictures or the live pictures we're getting. Yeah. It looks like we're waiting from the, for them to emerge from... Uh, the yes, yeah, so this is... Well, this is the Prince and Princess of Wales visiting Fitzalan High School in Cardiff. We are expecting their Royal Highnesses uh, to arrive imminently, uh, actually. Yeah. Oh, they're um, arriving. To, to, I, well, I it takes some time arriving. at 20 mile an hour limit. So you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did I just say that? Yes, I did. Yes. yes. Well, I think somehow they might get away with that because I very much will have a police escort uh, with them. But they're going to be meeting uh, different high school children, but also looking at the vocational courses that this school provides, particularly different uh, training that, they, that sick formers get in particular to get on with employment. Cameron, thanks very much indeed for taking us through that. And, of course, we'll reflect on, on the visit as it continues. Thank you.
Right, with speculation swirling around about the Prime Minister's HS2 decision, the question everyone is asking is, what will be the impact of a possible cancellation on the Tories' fortunes at the next election? Well, Rishi Sunak appears to be uh, catching up with uh, Keir Starmer in terms of... Uh personal polling, at least in the polls, but net zero turnaround, is it enough to hold on to number 10? Well, consultant and pollster Frank Luntz, I think, can join Chris uh, at Manchester. Are you there? Yes, you are, Chris. And uh, clearly, obviously, the slide rule will be uh, going across those um, polling figures and, and all the other sort of uh, feedback that they get at the moment. Yeah, that's right, Mark Abibba. Yeah, I'm with now with Frank Lunch, Lunch, the legendary pollster. Frank, in this big HS2 prevarication, we're in a, a train shed in Manchester. Is it a problem for the Tory party, or is it you've seen it over the years, haven't you? No, but it's still an issue. You do not want to have division in the middle of a party conference. If they try to spin it like this is no big deal, they're not telling you the truth. It's not something that's going to be fatal to them, but they're eager to get northern votes. They're eager to prove that leveling up matters. And if there's not going to be HS2, they better have an alternative right now. The truth is they've spent billions tunnelling under the south of England, spent the budget, and they can't link up Birmingham to Manchester. It's a disgrace. Well, I'm screaming about it in the States because we're going to do this between San Francisco and Los Angeles, and I'm saying, hell no, it's never going to happen. Yeah. In the end, it's not what you promise to do, it's what you actually deliver that matters. So this is yeah. not a topic that they're going to appreciate right in, now. In an interview today of uh, GB News with me earlier, the PM said there'll be a vote on, on this net zero watering down of targets. The issue of consent for net zero hasn't yet been, hasn't really been emerged here yet, but it will be emerging in coming weeks. But I What's can, your take on net zero? But it already exists. There is a consensus that Britain should lead the way on net zero without the consequences of a painful transition for individuals, for families, for homeowners, uh, flat owners. In the end, net zero has almost two-thirds support in this country and people are willing to make a sacrifice but only up but to when a they're asked point. to pay for it that falls down up to a certain point okay they'll give hundreds of pounds they're not going to pay thousands hey, you, of pounds you're an academic i've got to ask who these guys are behind you guys hello uh. <laughs> that's that's rally college okay it is the best education institution okay. in the UK, and they get a chance to enjoy an entire day of the party conference. Up or down? Thumbs up, thumbs down. They're enjoying themselves. Excellent. You, you're, but you're a pollster. You, you do focus groups. You saw the weekend opinion poll giving the Tories a 10% deficit to Labour. Is that an outlier? Is that real? I don't believe it's real. I do believe that the Conservatives have got the message. I believe that they understand that they need to do more to listen to and learn from their constituents. In the end, it's not going to be an endorsement of the Prime Minister and the party. Yeah. It's going to be an endorsement of each local MP, and that's absolutely yeah. necessary if they're to keep the majority. You're an old friend of Boris Johnson. You, you're Oxford with him for a bit. Yes. Isn't he who should be here, not Rishi Sunak? No, I asked this question of about 200, maybe 250 delegates here. And they are, they're happy with who's leading them, they're happy with the direction, but they want to do more, they want to go further, they want to demonstrate that they've earned and deserved another opportunity, and that's why all this yelling isn't helpful to Go further what, on tax cuts now? Show some leg on tax cuts, get the right on side? Uh, it's, that's such a British way to ask that question. <laughs> uh, how, would, how would you ask it? I, w I would okay. say that you have to prove that you're making life more affordable. Okay. That prices are coming down, the ability to buy things you want is more is But that's easier. the inflation answer. That's the inflation. It's a combination because in the end, the biggest tax of all is the inflation tax. And if they can address cost of living so that people can have the things they want, need yeah. and deserve, that gives them, that allows them to... I've got to ask you one last thing. The, the, the PM also said today, I asked him, would you allow Nigel Farage back into the Tory party? He said, we're a broad church. Is that wise? Should the fox be allowed back into the hen, hen house? I saw him here yesterday. He, in this area, he drew a crowd. People obviously want to hear what he has to say. Everyone's taking selfies with him. In the end, that's a decision that an American can't make. My only advice is... Go on make life more affordable, and that returns you to government. Okay. On that note, back to you, Mark and Pippa, in the studio.
really interesting insight. Christopher Hope, political editor, thank you very much for that, uh, talking yeah. to Frank Luntz there. I think interpreting uh, is the economy stupid, which we remember, of course, from a certain presidential race all those years ago. Now, a silent protest has been held outside the COVID-19 inquiry today as its second phase gets underway. The chair, Baroness Heather Hallett, saying that families who lost loved ones during the COVID-19 pandemic will not be ignored. But Rishi Sunak has told the inquiry that he is unable to provide WhatsApp messages from his time as Chancellor during the pandemic as he failed to back them up. Well, let's talk to GB News' national reporter Theo Chikomba, who uh, is outside the inquiry. Theo, bring us up to date then with, with what the inquiry has been hearing so far today. Yes, well, a very good afternoon to you. The biggest question today has been, did the government serve people well or did it fail them? Uh, they've been discussing the chronological uh, events that took place uh, during 2021, uh, the decisions that the government made, and it's mainly been about the governance uh, in this part of this module, about some of those key decisions uh, made in Westminster. As you've just reiterated there, um, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, um, at that time was Chancellor, and he uh, had been requested to give some of his WhatsApp messages, and he's been unable to do that. As we understand, uh, there was a change of handset, uh, so he's not been able to do that. But for families, though, some describe it as opening a wound, having to relive uh, some of those stories. And indeed, today, at the beginning of this hearing, uh, we saw a video with 14 families who uh, lost some of their relatives during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we did hear from earlier on today and this is what he had to say about some of those decisions made by the government. I was absolutely mortified at the time. I knew that it would actually lead to more of a disaster, more deaths, more people suffering uh, the long-term effects of COVID. Yeah, it was absolutely reckless on the behalf of the government. Um, I don't feel they took the medica medications uh, appropriately and um, they didn't take the steps to protect the country or the people. You know, we knew social distancing was a huge part of this and basically what they did is not encourage crowds to gather in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, it's totally reckless. Well, today, uh, most of what's been heard uh, through this hearing has been led by uh, the lead counsel to the inquirer, uh, Hugh, Hugo Keith, and he's been uh, mentioning some of those submissions this morning, and we understand uh, they're going to continue that this afternoon, just after 2 p.m. But he was raising a number of questions about should certain departments should have been it should have been involved um, in the government's uh, processes at the time. Uh, should the government have taken more steps uh, within their powers to ensure that they made the decisions at the right time? We've heard about sporting events. Uh, we've heard about closures in schools and previous uh, modules. And, of course, um, some expertise from science, uh, scientific experts across the country. And we also saw some of those numbers, around 230,000 people who have uh, the de have COVID as a reason for death um, during that time. And of course, uh, it's all the families that are having to rehear uh, some of these uh, scenarios again. But what they say they want is uh, more uh, answers uh, from those who are in power at that time. And of course, perhaps the government in power at the moment can learn should something happen like this in the future in this country and across the world. Theo, over the next uh, nine weeks, there will be ministers and other government officials giving evidence. Do we have any idea of who is going to be there? Yes, so we are. We do understand we'll hear uh, some evidence from the current Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, alongside a number of scientific experts who were either working during that time uh, and provided um, some support during that time and advice uh, to the current government. Uh, and there'll be a number of people alongside them over the next uh, couple of weeks. This is due uh, to continue until the 14th of December in this particular module. Theo Chukomba, GB News' national reporter, thanks very much for that update uh, from the start of the, the second phase, the crucial phase of the COVID inquiry. Coming up in the next hour, more from Manchester as we speak to the Prime Minister and more too on HS2. As Andy Street, the Tory mayor of the West Midlands, says private companies are willing to step in to help. All the latest, stay with us.
Hello, it's a blustery, showery day. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. I'm Alex Burkill. If we start off looking at the bigger picture and there is an area of low pressure just to the north of the UK and tightly packed isobars indicate that it is going to be quite windy, breezy for many of us. Meanwhile, high pressure is building from the south and that is going to quieten our weather down across southern parts this week. Through the rest of Tuesday though, yes, it's breezy and there are plenty of showers around. Some sunny spells in between the showers, but particularly towards the north and west of the UK, those showers could be quite heavy at times and there may be some rumbles of thunder mixed in as well. Temperatures are going to be down a little bit compared to recently. It's going to feel quite fresh at times, especially in those brisk, blustery winds. Through the end of the day, we'll continue to see some showers, particularly across northern and western parts. Some clear skies developing down the east and in the south as well. Meanwhile, as we go through the night, we are going to see a swathe of wet weather pushing its way in from the west, affecting many parts of Scotland. Some heavy rain likely here. Temperatures aren't going to drop a huge amount for many towns and cities, though some rural spots towards the east where we get the clear skies could turn a little chilly. So Wednesday then, a bit of a north-south split, a fairly wet picture across many parts of Scotland, quite cloudy. The rain will be heavy at times and building up with some high totals, particularly for western parts of Scotland. Meanwhile, a drier picture further south, albeit there will be a few showers to watch out for, particularly across parts of Wales and southwest England. Temperatures for many will be similar to today. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel... Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel.
Very good afternoon. It's two o'clock. You're with the live desk here on GB News and coming up for you this Tuesday lunchtime. The Prime Minister has spoken to GB News ahead of his conference speech tomorrow. Our political editor, Christopher Hope, asked Rishi Sunak the questions you want answering. We'll bring you the full interview right here on the live desk. And the COVID questions too. Just why were large-scale sporting events permitted as the disease ran rife across the UK? We're live at today's crucial stage of Baroness Hallett's key inquiry. Plus, we're live from a BMA rally in Manchester as doctors call on ministers to end the deadlock or risk walkouts running into the winter. Speaking earlier, the health secretary says the BMA's leadership is not on the side of patients. Also coming up, this. The huge fireball which lit up the sky in Oxford after a lightning strike. Uh, Not we'll bring it Well, yeah, it is so dramatic, we'll have to wait for it a little later. It hit a green power plant. We'll be hearing about the aftermath from an eyewitness. First, though, the latest headlines with Aaron. And a very good afternoon to you. It's a minute past two. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Battle lines are being drawn with the Prime Minister telling GB News he's the person to deliver change to Britain. Rishi Sunak has also defended his record on illegal immigration, saying for the first time ever the, small number of, the number of small boats crossing the Channel is down by a fifth. He's also reiterated his plan to half inflation and accused the Labour leader of being weak on his policies. You've got Keir Starmer, who, you know, no one knows what he stands for, flip-flops left and right. The country can see through that. That's not leadership. What I'm offering is different. I know people want change. I'm the person to deliver it because we're going to do politics differently. You saw that on Net Zero. You'll see that this week. That's what you get from a Conservative government. Stopping the boats is listed as one of the Prime Minister's five priorities. The latest figures show more than 25,000 people have been intercepted crossing the Channel so far this year. Just over 33,000 people had made the crossing by this time last year. The Home Office says the Small Boats Operation Command is working alongside French authorities and other agencies to disrupt people smugglers. It comes as the Home Secretary says some immigrants are not embracing British values and are living parallel lives to the rest of the country. At an event in Bolton, Suella Braverman said they're coming from abroad, they're not learning the language and they're not taking part in British life. She added it is her job to be fearless in calling that out. We have a great multi-ethnic society and in many parts of our country integration has worked. But there are also many towns and cities around the United Kingdom where it hasn't. And communities uh, ha are living parallel lives. They are coming from abroad, they are not learning the language, they're not embracing British values, and they're not taking part in British life. And that needs to be identified. We need to be fearless in calling that out. And that's my job. Meanwhile, uh, the Prime Minister is yet to confirm the government's position on the future of the northern leg of the HS2 rail project. Uh, businesses are demanding immediate clarity following reports Rishi Sunak is planning to scrap the line from Birmingham to Manchester. It's understood the Prime Minister will soften the blow by announcing spending on other infrastructure projects for the North in his speech tomorrow. Trans women could be prevented from using female-only hospital wards. Under new government plans, trans patients would be treated in separate accommodation, which the campaign group Stonewall says will be humiliating and dangerous. The Health Secretary Steve Barclay outlined the proposal at the conference earlier. We will change the NHS constitution following a consultation later this year to make sure we respect the privacy, dignity and safety of all patients, recognise the importance of dial different biological needs and protect the rights of women. Junior doctors have threatened further industrial action in November and December unless they receive a credible pay offer. They've been demonstrating outside the conference centre in Manchester alongside consultants as part of their three-day strike. Uh, radiographers have also walked out for 24 hours. The BMA are demanding a return to the negotiating table, but the government says this year's 6% pay rise is final. Murderers who carry out sexually motivated attacks will automatically face a whole life sentence under new powers. The legal expectation on judges will apply retrospectively to those who have already been charged with the crime, but 
are yet to be sentenced. Justice Secretary Alex Chalk says for the most dangerous and depraved killers, life should really mean life. A 13-year-old boy is admitted to killing his grandmother in Sheffield. Marcia Grant died when the child who was driving her car hit her with the vehicle. The boy, who can't be named for legal reasons, was 12 at the time. He'll be sentenced in December after pleading guilty to causing death by dangerous driving. A 12-year-old boy is in critical condition after being struck by lightning in Hertfordshire. It happened during a football tournament at the Cellar School in Hartford yesterday. A man in his 50s was also hit. Meanwhile, lightning also struck a recycling plant in Oxfordshire, causing a huge fire. A fireball lit up the sky when a gas tank exploded at a food processing plant in Cassington. Firefighters tackled the blaze overnight and continue to monitor the site. No injuries have been reported. The Prince and Princess of Wales are in Cardiff to meet members of the Windrush generation. William and Kate were greeted by cheering school children as they arrived at an event marking the start of Black History Month. Now, the couple will meet Windrush organisations to hear about their contribution to the Welsh community. We are live across the UK on TV, on digital radio and on your smart speaker to just say play GB News. That's it for me. Now back to Mark and Pip. Aaron, thank you. Well, the Conservative Party conference has been dominated by questions over the future of the northern leg of HS2. But there are other pressing issues for the Prime Minister to deal with if he's to convince voters that his party is worthy of winning another term in government. Well, earlier the Prime Minister spoke to our political editor, Chris Hope, uh, with a conference call still threatening to be derailed by that issue of HS2 and indeed the reaction of even former Tory Prime Ministers to it. But Rishi Sunak spoke on a variety of issues, including whether he'd welcome a certain Nigel Farage as a Conservative MP. Prime Minister, what do you stand for? I stand for doing the right thing for the country in the long term, not taking the easy way out. I think that's the change that people want to see in their politics. That's the change that I'm going to bring. And you mm. saw that with my decision on net zero. Mm. Uh, I did something that I thought was right. You know, it was a big decision. And look, people could criticise me for that. But I thought what we're yeah. doing, the path we're on, is going to cost ordinary families five, ten, fifteen thousand pounds. I didn't think that was right. We can hit our targets without doing those things. So I went out and set out a new realistic approach. And that's what you're going to see from me. That's the type of leadership you're going to get from me, because that's how we're going to change not just politics, mm. that's how we're going to change our country for the better. You mentioned net zero there. In that press conference last week, you said that a lack of consent risks support for net zero. Why not give MPs a vote? They never voted before net zero, have they? Well, actually, MPs do vote on these carbon budgets, which decide how much we're going to reduce carbon emissions. And one of the things I pointed out in my new approach to net zero is we've got to be more transparency around that when that vote happens again in the future. So when I said very clearly, when MPs vote on the amount of carbon reduction that we're going to do, alongside that, they should be considering mm. all the measures that are required to deliver that yeah. carbon reduction. That's the kind of honesty and transparency that politicians should yeah. have with the country. I didn't like this kind of Westminster consensus that all this stuff was being cooked up over here. People weren't being open with the country about what was required. I wanted to change yeah. that. And look, and as you could see, there were people who criticised me for the decision I made, but I'm going to do what I believe is right for the long term of this country. I'm not going to take the easy way out. That's my approach to leadership. Okay. This time last year, you weren't Prime Minister, you are now. How does it feel to be at a conference when most members didn't vote for you? No, I, I'm the conference, the spirit of conference is great. You know, mm. I've been out and about talking to members, talking to colleagues. People have a spring in their step, they can see that we're making progress. When I first became PM, I set out five immediate priorities to focus on. Halving inflation, inflation is coming down. Stopping the boats, really important. And the numbers this year are down by a fifth. First time that's happened that someone's brought the numbers down. So look, those plans are working mm. and people are responding well to what we're doing. New approach on net zero, increasing the national living wage for two million low paid people. Today, Jade's yeah. Law, making sure that awful criminals who murder their partners don't have any rights yeah. over their children. That yeah, obviously okay. is not common sense. We're changing that. And crucially, supporting people in towns. More people live in towns in our country than live in big cities to get all the attention from Westminster politicians. I'm changing that. We're giving people in towns, 55 towns across the UK, okay. a billion pounds long-term funding and putting local people in charge of how to spend that money. So look, there's lots of good stuff going on. Good stuff. 
it, is it right though on tax that nurses and teachers will be paying the higher rate of income tax by 2027 on current uh, forecasts? Look, I, I'm a conservative. Everyone here at this conference wants to see taxes yes. come down. Of course we do. So That's when? What we when is the for. question? Well, the best, the best tax cut I can deliver for people is to halve inflation. Mm. It's inflation that is making life difficult for nurses, for teachers, for yes. everyone else that you talked about. Yes. And that's why the first of my five mortgage? priorities have, is to make, halve inflation. Have you ever had a mortgage yourself? Now, of, of course I have. And, and, and it's exactly why I want to ease feel the, the burden on people's mortgages. How do we do that? If we restrain inflation, then interest rates can stop going up and start coming down, right? Mm. That's straightforward economics, right? Mm. That's the best way for me to help people. Mm. And the plan is working. Yeah. When I came into office, inflation was at 11%. But we are getting it down. The last few numbers show that the plan is working. And just as Margaret Thatcher did, just as Nigel Lawson did, those are proud conservatives. I'm following in their tradition, get inflation down, because inflation is the evil that we must defeat, and good things will flow from that. At the weekend, three cabinet ministers, your colleagues, said that ECHR withdrawal should be on the table. Is it? Well, what all of us are completely agreed on is that stopping the boats is a priority. That's why one of my five priorities is to stop the boats. We're doing a lot of things to bring that about, and I really want all your uh, viewers to know this. For the first time since small boats become a thing, the numbers are down this mm. year. Let me just say that again. Yeah. They are down. Yeah. They are down by a down fifth. By fifth. Yeah. Right? That hasn't happened anywhere else in Europe. They're down because of all the things we're doing. The new deal I signed with Albania. We've returned almost 3,000 illegal migrants to Albania. And you know what? They've stopped coming. Yeah. That's why we need to get Rwanda up and running. Now, I am confident that the plans we've got in place will work. They will deliver. They've got a lot to do. Of course we've got a lot to do. But this is a huge priority for me, and we're making a difference. Will you ever stop the boats? As I said, look, for the first yes, time ever, will. for the first time ever, the numbers are down. Yes. They are down by a fifth. That didn't happen by accident. Mm. That happened because we're doing a bunch of things. New Deal with Albania, tackling crime gangs mm. in, uh, upstream in different parts of Europe. Look, my view on this is simple. It should be the British people who decide who comes to our country and mm. not criminal gangs. And do you know what? I talk to other European leaders a lot when I'm out and about. They're increasingly seeing that too. The conversation on this in Europe has changed. When I set out my stall on this eight months ago, again, lots of people criticised me, but what you're seeing now from lots of other European leaders is the acknowledgement that what I said is right. They are all recognising that it needs to be our countries that are in control of who comes to us, not gangs, and we need to have systems that make that possible. So as I said then, where Britain leads, others will follow, and you're seeing that that is now happening. You may have noticed that Nigel Farage is wandering around your conference, first time in decades. Would you have him back as a member of the Tory party? Now, uh, the, the Tory party is a very broad church, right? I welcome lots of people who want to subscribe to, our, ideas, to our values, right? And look, the, the thing I care about is delivering for the country, and the more people, as I've seen at this conference, we've got record attendance, I think, at this conference, lots of energy, lots of engagement, people are responsible responding well to what we're doing. We're making the right long-term decisions for the country. We're, we want to bring change. That's what I'm about. The contrast with Labour could not be clearer. You've got Keir Starmer, who, you know, no one knows what he stands for, flip-flops left and right. The country can see through that. That's not leadership. What I'm offering is different. I know people want change. I'm the person to deliver it because we're going to do politics differently. You saw that on Net Zero. You'll see that this week. That's what you get from a Conservative government. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. So the Prime Minister trying to get the policy and political agenda back on track. But while he was speaking there to Chris Hope, uh, we had then the Chancellor uh, at a fringe meeting criticising Andy Street, the West Midlands Tory mayor, uh, for his comments on HS2. Andy Street then indicating that he's not ruling out resigning over the issue, making an impassioned last-ditch appeal to the Prime Minister not to cancel the link. Uh, well, let's get more with Catherine Forster, who is in Manchester for us. Catherine, this just won't go away. Way, despite the Prime Minister um, trying to sort of shunt it into the sidings, if you like. Yes, exactly. This row is going on and on, and despite the government saying no decision has been made, we are expecting it to be cancelled. I was told that it was to be cancelled yesterday. We're expecting the announcement tomorrow. But before we talk about HS2, Pip, especially for you and for all the animal lovers watching, I bring you some very lovely guide dogs. On the right, we have Diamond, beautifully behaved, along with Colin. Colin, thank you. And on the left, we have Inca having a lie down. I think there'll probably be a lot of people here could do with a lie down. Thank you so much. 
OK, let's go for a walk. So, yes, the row is continuing. As you've just mentioned, the mayor of the West Midlands and, of course, HS2 is definitely going to Birmingham. He's a Conservative mayor, normally a big supporter of the government, but he is absolutely furious. He's been speaking out. He's saying this is not going to happen without a big fight. And Jeremy Hunt has been criticising him. So there is a lot of anger within the Conservative Party itself about what seems likely to happen, which is that this HS2 line that the North was promised that was going to go to Leeds till 2021 when it was killed, now won't go to Manchester either. But meanwhile, Rishi Sunak, that interview with Chris Hope, really trying to get the narrative back onto what the Prime Minister wants to talk about. And he sounded pretty positive, didn't he? Yes, he was trotting out his five pledges, as he likes to do at any opportunity, but he's having a little bit more luck than he was just a couple of months ago because infl inflation is going down. The government is confident they'll get it to half what it was by the end of the year. He's saying inflation is evil, that a drop in inflation is the biggest tax cut that they can give. Well, sure, it's not a tax cut, but obviously inflation goes down. That is a massive help to people. He's also saying about the small boats, OK, they haven't stopped the boats. There's a lot of crossings, some 25,000 this year. But, of course, they are down about... 20%. So he's hailing that as an achievement as well. Also, there's a big focus now on we're, we're in a disused train station, well, it was a train station until 1969. Um, but a big focus now from the Conservatives on drivers. Rishi Sunak said the other day um, this war on the motorist, as he puts it, is going to end. There's a lot of focus from Mark Harper on drivers. They see this as a real vote winner. And talking about this softening of the green targets, they want to paint themselves as the party out there for hardworking families, hoping to save them money, saying, no, we're not rowing back on net zero. Um, but we want it to be affordable for people. And quite a clever ruse in that they're going to uh, have a vote on the softening of these net zero targets and Labour will have to vote on that too. And I suspect that will then be used against Labour in the forthcoming general election. Catherine, thank you very much. You should have asked those dogs what they thought of HS2. They might have made more sense than what we're hearing from the Prime Minister at the moment about it, but thank you very much. It's a rough deal. Uh, Director General at the Institute of Export and International Trade, Marco Foggioni, joins us now from uh, Manchester. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Infrastructure, of course, key to all these decisions. I would just like to bowl the question at HS2, uh, even though the Prime Minister doesn't want to talk about it. How important is it that these decisions are made and that uh, particularly investors get some certainty before coming in uh, inward investment? So yesterday evening I was with a group of business leaders uh, from Manchester and it was very clear that they are exceptionally concerned about uh, the fact that HS2 seems like it's going to be cancelled. And HS2 isn't just about passenger numbers, it's also about freight connectivity. Right. Uh, and when the government uh, had made the commitment, uh, both businesses in the UK and international investors made decisions on their investments in the UK and I think a decision at at this stage to not complete the Manchester leg of HS2 does cause significant problems uh, for the UK and internationally it calls into question the UK's ability to both plan and deliver these major infrastructure projects. Uh, and Marco, there's a, a key point here where Jeremy Hunt himself has been asking how come that the French can deliver their network, the H, uh, TGV, for instance, we can't. What is your analysis of that? Why is it they've been able to do it on the continent and we can't do it here? 
the issues of hows and whys, um, I think, are, are pretty complex and intricate. I think the, the reality is we have to, the government will have to review uh, what's happened in this instance if they are going to scrap it and, and really ask some tough questions of what that means for the future and what needs to be done to ensure that the UK is an attractive place for inward investment. And there's a real imperative that we get these sorts of things right, whether it's a rail or road or broadband. We have to invest to develop world-class infrastructure projects. Uh, the Institute of Export and International Trade uh, carried out a piece of research on trade in services, which is 80% of the UK economy. And some of the key drivers for the growth in uh, trade in services is infrastructure, proximity to uh, airports, access to rail, and access to high-speed broadband. And uh, it, for the UK to continue to be a world-leading centre for services, we've got to get these things right. The problem is, Marco, is this issue of HS2 is, is straddling the whole political divide, isn't it? You've got former prime ministers saying it's a mistake to, to axe this Manchester leg. You've got the former uh, Chancellor George Osborne uh, urging Rishi Sunak to reconsider. He says it would be a tragedy to cancel it. I'm not going to get into uh, party politics or the internal uh, uh, conversations, discussions within the Conservative Party. Looking as an organisation which exists purely to support and encourage international trade and to ensure that the UK economy seizes all the b tremendous opportunities uh, that international trade brings for businesses, um, our role is to highlight where things need to change and what the key drivers of international trade are. And and the, the imperative is that all the research shows that businesses which trade internationally are more sustainable, more resilient, they are more innovative, they employ more people and are more profitable. So getting this right is really important. Marco, thank you very much for bringing us that perspective there at Manchester uh, as, of course, uh, the, all with the Export and International Trade Association. Thank you very much indeed. Stay with us here on the live desk. Uh, we'll be staying in Manchester, but this time at a BMA rally as the health secretary says the association is not on the side of patients. You're with the live desk. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare Commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app.
And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the live desk. Let's take you straight live to New York. Yes, Donald Trump's motorcade is making its way through the streets back to court as his civil trial continues in Manhattan. And uh, it is a case that could dismantle a few parts of uh, the US, the former US president's massive business empire and really affect his ability to do business in New York because... Donald Trump, along with his two sons and nearly a dozen business associates, is accused of inflating the value of his assets by billions of dollars to secure more favourable loans and insurance terms. Yeah, Judge Arthur Engren uh, last week had already ruled that the Trump organisation overvalued assets by between $812 million and $2.2 billion, uh, referring to the tax assessment of the Mar-a-Lago complex down in Florida at $18 million, as asking how is that possible. So the state of New York uh, declaring that Trump had done this to get better loan terms, saving, they allege, at least $100 million. He has denied any wrongdoing. His lawyers say they will appeal. He was in court for the first day yesterday. Uh, expect him to enter the courtroom again with that uh, trademark glower we see so often these <laughs> days. Also, plenty of uh, Secret Service agents as well. Uh, that is the courtroom that you are looking at where he will be arriving shortly. Uh, yesterday, he was... Uh, sat at the defendant's table, occasionally speaking to his lawyers, as uh, an attorney accused him of lying year after year in his financial statements. Yeah, yesterday, clearing on his social media platform, he would come to fight for my name and reputation. Uh, and uh, he uh, said that the state attorney general, Leticia D James, was corrupt and racist, and that the judge was unfair, unhinged and vicious in his pursuit of me. And then outside this uh, Supreme Court in Lower Manhattan, calling the case a sham, he said, my financial statements are phenomenal which maybe is not quite the right phrase one might have used, because clearly I think the state is saying, yes, they are phenomenal, but in the wrong direction. But none of this is affecting his commanding lead over his rivals in the race for the Republican presidential nomination. That is according to the latest polls. This is one of many cases he is facing, because he's also facing criminal charges in Washington, uh, in Georgia and in Florida. He's also denied wrongdoing uh, over those cases relating to trying to uh, overturn the results of the 2020 election and handling classified documents upon leaving office. Uh, he has denied wrongdoing and pleaded not guilty in all four cases there. And apart from that, of course, he's running for President of the United States. Uh, the sun is shining in New York. Uh, we have to tell you that the sun apparently is going to be shining in the UK. I'm just looking at the latest we're getting from the Met Office, uh, which is expecting the UK to be as hot as Ibiza this weekend. Uh, this just coming in. They say the south of England could be as hot as Athens, 
at 25 C Celsius, hotter than Barcelona, which is predicted to have 24 Celsius. Temperatures could hit 26 Celsius in some places of the southeast, says the Met Office, making it as hot as the Med. Uh, the last hottest temperature recorded in October 2011 at Gravesend when it reached 29.9 C. Not quite there yet. This is but... not right. Not when the leaves oh, are falling off the trees. <laughs> Bring it on. Bring it on. The Health Secretary has claimed the BMA leadership is not on side of change and not on the side of patients. It uh, comes his comments as NHS consultants say they will not take any more strike action for four weeks if, if the government gets around the table for negotiations. Well, of course, we had the assertion earlier, too, from Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, that they tried time and time, or multiple times, he said, to meet the BMA uh, over the strike action, but they hadn't been able to do so. The BMA now holding a rally in Manchester, of course, where the conference is, is taking place. Our news reporter, Jack Carson, is there for us and has been speaking to those doctors. And what, what's been the response to the government's assertion that they've been trying to speak to the BMA when the BMA has indicated they've not had discussions for, what, 100 days, I think? Yeah, that's... Now, since Steve Barkley last formally sat around the table negotiating, of course, the issue of pay with the British Medical Association. And from the speakers that have been here at the rally today, it, it feels like a united feeling that actually the government aren't going, coming back to the table and aren't reaching out to them. Of course, that is different, as you said, to what Rishi Sunak mentioned this morning, that they have attempted to make contact at this stage and this, and this position, unless there is, of course, um, that around the table and actually negotiate rather than just have a conversation but bring uh, reopen the negotiations the British Medical Association are of course reluctant to possibly do that but of course the message very much here from the rally this afternoon as you can see from the people behind me with their placards with their bright orange BMA hats on has been all about pay restoration about recognizing the work that these doctors did throughout the pandemic and the and the, and the effort and the levels of, of pay restoration therefore they feel like they do Deserve. Uh, uh, Phil Banfield, who's the chair, of course, of the of the BMA Council, says they want to be valued the same as their expertise as it was back in 2008. Now, of course, we know for the junior doctors, who of course are a part of this joint strike with the senior consultants, that means a 35% pay increase. But of course, the government say that that's unsustainable, that's unfeasible. Steve Barclay saying, of course, that the BMA are, are, are not on are, are not on the public side, um, and so. Yeah, where, where that kind of pay restoration comes from. It's certainly not, of course, what, what the government are looking to do because from their position, they accepted the independent pay review body's recommendations. That was an average of 8.8% rise this year for the junior doctors and 6% for those more senior consultants. And even under... GB News. Uh, Jack, last we're, week we're just going to interrupt you. We're getting a, a, a break up on the signal, so apologies for that. Uh, we did get most of what you were saying there, but uh, clearly we've got some problems with the signal from Manchester. But thank you very much indeed as uh, we get an update with that uh, BMA rally there in the city centre. Do stay with us. We'll be talking about James Bond and uh, an incredible auction that, that's taking place. Lots of, lots of goodies to feast your eyes over them. And, live, uh, live and let buy. If you, if you've got been working very hard pounds. on that all day. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get the headlines now with Aaron. It's Armstrong, Aaron Armstrong, and it's 2.32 here in the GB Newsroom. Battle lines are being drawn with the Prime Minister telling GB News he's the person to deliver change to Britain. Rishi Sunak has also defended his record on illegal immigration, saying for the first time ever the number of small boats crossing the Channel is down by a fifth. He also reiterated his plan to half inflation and accused the Labour leader of being weak on his policies. You've got Keir Starmer, who, you know, no one knows what he stands for, flip flops left and right. The country can see through that. That's not leadership. What I'm offering is different. I know people want change. I'm the person to deliver it because we're going to do politics differently. You saw that on Net Zero. You'll see that this week. That's what you get from a Conservative government. The government plans to ban trans women from female hospital wards. Health Secretary Steve Barclay told his party's conference the changes would protect the privacy, dignity and safety of all patients while pushing back against wokery in the NHS. The campaign group Stonewall says the plans are unworkable and will make health care for trans women humiliating and dangerous. 
The Prime Minister, meanwhile, has yet to confirm the government's position on the future of the northern leg of the HS2 rail project. Businesses are demanding immediate clarity following reports Rishi Sunak is to scrap the line from Birmingham to Manchester. It's understood the Prime Minister will soften the blow by announcing spending on other infrastructure projects for the North in a speech tomorrow. More on all of our stories, as always, on our website, gbnews.com. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel... Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to the live desk uh, and let's mark a, a key second phase of the COVID-19 public inquiry today with the chair Baroness Heather Hallett saying that families who lost loved ones during that pandemic will not be ignored. But Rishi Sunak has told the inquiry that he's unable to provide WhatsApp messages from his time as Chancellor during the pandemic as he failed to back them up. Well, let's get more from outside that inquiry now with our national reporter, Thea Chikomba. And Thea, we know that uh, the whole intent is to try and learn lessons rather than apportion blame. But clearly what they are looking at now is this stage at what decisions were made by the government and what the consequences were. 
That's right. Well, the big question today has been, did the government fail uh, to, to help people during that time or did it serve people well uh, during that beginning uh, part of the pandemic? This afternoon, uh, the hearing has just resumed and they've been looking into some of those restrictions which were put in different places at different times across the country. Did that help uh, the national picture? For example, some other places will be told uh, you can't go to different places, can't meet with family and friends and others they had uh, completely uh, full lockdowns in their areas now of course families who were affected we saw uh, a formal video this morning where uh, they were sharing some of the impact it's had some who lost their children their grandmothers uh, their wives husbands um, during that period at care homes and some uh, in hospital there weren't too many um, ideas about what's happening at that time we did hear about what was happening in Wuhan uh, but here in this country, there have been questions about what the government should have done during that time. Did they act quickly enough? Did they seek the right advice? And what lessons can they learn uh, from that period? Should something like this happen again in the future? We did speak to one man called Charles earlier who spoke about uh, what's happened in his family. He's lost uh, his wife and uh, also his mother during 2021. And he had this to say about the inquiry so far. Yeah, it was absolutely reckless on the behalf of the government. Um, I don't feel they took the medica medications uh, appropriately and um, they didn't take the steps to protect the country or the people. You know, we knew social distancing was a huge part of this and basically what they did is encourage crowds to gather in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, it's totally reckless. Well, it's been described by MPs, by some of them, as one of the country's worst public health failures. Can lessons be learned during this inquiry? We understand the hearings will take place until 2026, although there isn't a formal deadline of when they will publish some of those findings. In the next few weeks, we'll hear from uh, the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson and from uh, the current uh, uh, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who was the Chancellor at that time, alongside some some of those medical experts who were advising them and helping them during that time. But of course, for families, they'll be hoping that the current government and further into the future uh, can learn lessons from this pandemic. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for updating us uh, there, of course, as uh, we continue to monitor uh, what they uh, look at and, and find out for all those families and relatives. We've been expecting you, Mr Bond, or at least we've been expecting quite a lot of your suits. Hundreds of items belonging to Sir Roger Moore are going up for auction tomorrow in London with Bond fans queuing up to see if they can buy a piece of 007 film history and help one of Sir Roger's cherished charities. Yes, of course, he worked very closely with UNICEF. Well, the deputy chairman of the auctioneers, Bonhams, allowed us to spy on the preparations for a celebration of a man who truly now seems to have created a golden gun. So this year it marks the 50th anniversary of Sir Roger playing James Bond for the very first time in Live and Let Die. And uh, he died sadly five years ago and his family felt this was the right time to give his fans the world over a chance to bid on some of these lots. Well, there are so many unique items in this cell and from James Bond interest, I think for me, this coat behind me which is uh, a Chesterfield um, coat that he wore in his first film, Live and Let Die. And in fact, in the very first scene, you see him coming out of JFK Airport wearing the coat, and he gets in a taxi on his way to see the villain of the film, Mr. Big. Well, one of the most important lots in the cell is this James Bond Amiga Seamaster watch, which is a limited edition number, but it's actually unique because it was given to Sir Roger on the 50th anniversary of the franchise by Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson. And they are, of course, the producers of the Bond franchise. And engraved on the back of the strap, it actually says, to Roger, with love from Barbara and Michael. Well, I think everyone knows that Sir Roger Moore was a very keen skier, and he's involved in two of the great ski chases in Bond, the Bond history. This ski suit, I think, is just so iconic. It comes from his last film, The View to a Kill, and it's the opening sequence when he comes down the slope and he's chased by a bunch of guys with, you know, on skis with guns. And he skis, then he snowboards, and then he ends up in a, in a submarine at the end of it. The cabinet behind me has some really fun things from his 
40th anniversary Swatch watch collection in this wonderful 007 case. Um, we've got his wallet with um, his bank cards in it um, and a couple of backgammon sets as well. One of which, the one beneath here in the red leather case, he would play on set with Cubby Broccoli. I understand for high stakes and they would sort of settle up at the end of the series and if Cubby was winning, he wouldn't let Roger go back on set until they'd finished the game. So it's some great stories behind that and some great games played on the board, I imagine. Well, Sir Roger Moore played James Bond more than any other actor, seven times between 1973 and 1985. And in my opinion, he's the best dressed of all the Bonds. And here we have one of the most iconic dinner suits that he wore. And this is from The View to a Kill. He wore it in that amazing scene at the Eiffel Tower where he's um, chasing after May Day, placed by Grace Jones. And they go up and then down the Eiffel Tower. He's standing on a lift shaft going up and down. So the estimate on the suit is 20 to 30,000 pounds. And again, we'll see where this ends up on the day. Well, we're really, really excited about the sale. Um, there has been unparalleled um, interest and excitement the world over. It's been on tour in the States and also in France. And it's a very accessible sale because we've got lots at about £100 for a Corgi toy car, up to the big lots like his personal Amiga Seamaster watch at twenty to 30000 And, of course, his wonderful James Bond suits as well. Well, let's get the views now of the chairman of the James Bond International Fan Club, David Black. David, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, Pips fancied this Seamaster watch. I quite like the Lamborghini skis. I just wonder what took your fancy. <laughs> to be fair, my wife's banned me from buying any more rubbish, unfortunately. <laughs> I've, I've collected uh, well, so many things over the years that she's... Uh, Told me I've forbidden from looking, but there are some great things for sale there. Yeah, someone's going to enjoy going around this winter with the uh, ski suit on and uh, yeah, yeah. keep keep the warmth in. And um, yeah, dinner jacket. Maybe I could have had that on today rather than I could have smartened up a bit for your fine program. What what seems astonishing, David, is that is that um, Roger Moore actually had all this stuff in boxes for years. Um, you know, and it was well, only recently that, that his family decided to do something with it. I think it's the case, isn't it, that when you're in that position, it probably means less to him than it would to us, you know. To the fans, they think that's great. To him, it's just another bit of clothing or a watch. I mean, the watch, that would be a great thing, wouldn't it? Be happy with that. Yeah, although we reflect, I think, uh, you know, Fleming uh, issued him with a, a Rolex Submariner uh, originally, which he could use as a knuckle duster. But, I mean, it's interesting that yeah. there's been, I think, probably a reassessment of the, the Roger Moore films and his position as Bond, where he was treated, perhaps, you know, as a bit of a, uh, an imposter after all the Sean Connery uh, films originally. I think, yeah, people... I grew up with the Roger Moore films. I love them, you know. I think it depends what era you're in. Sean Connery was always a hard act to follow. Everyone has their favourites. There's people swear that Sean's the best, others like Daniel Craig, etc. But Roger, he held his own. He did a great job. Times were easier then, you know. It was a less complicated world, maybe. And I, I still... When I go back and watch some of those films, I think they're great. You know, Live and Let Die, that's a classic film. And we're just looking at pictures now of the, of the, the white ski suit. Um, and actually standing next to that is Roger Moore's son. I think it's um, two sons, Jeffrey and yeah. Christian. That was Jeffrey, who looks astonishingly like his dad. It's funny. I stood in the queue for the premiere. I'm not dropping names. I stood in the queue for the premiere for about half an hour talking to Jeffrey. And it was only when I got to the front I realised who he was. <laughs> <laughs> but... But, but uh, and I said to him, I said, what the hell are you standing here with us for? I said, surely you could have got in. He says, yeah, I stood in the wrong queue. What an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was just a little story about Jeffrey. But, yes, uh, you know, the, all, all great. And uh, I guess they will miss Roger. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, the family's having a bit of a clear-up, but the other aspect is that much of this will go to, I think, UNICEF, which was uh, one of Sir Roger's um, favourite charities. In, in fact, he worked tirelessly, didn't he, to help children across the world? He did. He did an amazing amount of work. And he never wanted people... Re he didn't go bragging about yeah, it. Yeah. He just did a lot of work for UNICEF. And, and they, I think they definitely miss his contribution. So, this, again, this will... Yeah, it's just one more late uh, donation, isn't it?
When you look at all the different items, David, and they're all fabulous, what, what do you think will, will attract the most, the, the largest bids? I think, to be fair, things like the watch, that's unique. No one's going to get a watch like that. That's going to go well. Um, I think it's all great. Things like the dinner suit, though, I don't know. And it's, but someone might get it and enjoy walking around the house on their own in it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the problem is they've still got the flared trousers, haven't they, given the age of, of when the films uh, came out? Yeah, they always say things come back into fashion. Maybe it will. Uh, Harry get, Styles get is well into flared trousers. Well, yeah, they, that, that's right. But yeah, I mean, that, that's. I guess that's the other aspect that he was, you know, in, impeccably dressed, wasn't he, in in real life as well as in terms of his film appearances, and that was part of the the Roger Moore sort of stamp. Yeah, even in his days as a saint, he was always well dressed. Was a very smart. So I'm not not sure it would fit me, but. <laughs> <laughs> David, it's so interesting to get, to get your thoughts on this, and I'm sure it's going to raise tens yeah. upon thousands of pounds um, for for UNICEF, isn't it? Uh, so thank you, thank you for talking us it's through it and un... giving us giving us your favourite. Yeah. We'll let you have a sneaky bid without telling your wife. It's all right, no, she won't notice. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell her, <laughs> David. Thanks very much indeed. We want to show you some uh, incredible pictures now. Uh, you might have seen this on, on the news earlier. It's the aftermath of a fire last night, which was caused by a lightning strike, which broke out at a processing facility in Oxfordshire. Yeah, you can see the aerial shots there showing the extent of the damage, the smoke still. Well, this is what happened last night with the videos showing this fireball in the sky and then bang, almost like some kind of explosion uh, that we see from a war zone uh, and a huge plume of, of flame and smoke uh, high into the air in the Oxfordshire uh, night time and it kept pulsing away as, of course, the aftermath of other uh, units there catching fire as well. But if you were a resident uh, living in the area or a motorist heading down the A34 near Oxford, you must have been wondering what on earth was going on. Well, Stuart Hoskin is business owner and former Big Brother contestant. You, Stuart, were an eyewitness. So what did you make of it when you first saw it? My goodness me. Yeah, it was quite interesting. I said we were... Hello, by the way. Um, so... <laughs> right. um, we were we were sat in the house. Firstly, the lights flickered, which is um, no no surprise with the storm that was going off around us. Um, and then there was this this like huge lightning strike. And um, being a responsible pet owner, my dog was running around outside, so I thought I'd better get him in. And um, as I opened up the door, there was just like a massive, just a, a huge boom, like like thunder, but like a single single explosion. And I then looked outside and thought, well, that's funny because there's a, there's a very interesting sunset happening. And then I obviously realized that there wasn't a sunset and that the sky was illuminated like you can see in that picture. I mean, literally where the uh, seven uh, Trent green plant is in Yarnton, is, it's more than half an hour from the back of our house. So uh, it, it, was, it was quite an impressive sight, to be fair. And it seemed to keep going as well. That's the other thing. I mean, obviously, with a lightning strike, you know, you get the big flash and it's over. But this, this continued. Yeah, it was the pulsating. I think that's, I think someone described it. As you can see where it is, it's pulsing, and, and that's what it was doing. It was, it, you know, there was no no heat intensity or anything, but you could just see in the sky very, it's very much pulsing in the red sky. And if you look at it, it looks like a sunset, right? And but it's obviously in the wrong place for the sun. But then it was sort of doing this very sort of weird illuminating on and off, um, almost like a northern light effect. So so it was uh, it was it was impressive, but it was sort of slightly worrying at the same time. Yeah, and uh, most importantly, there was, we understand, no one injured in the incident. Emergency services, of course, were called. It did cause um, some traffic issues, but, but nobody was hurt. Yeah, thank goodness. I, I think, you know, when you look at something like that, and unfortunately, I think the time of night it was, you know, 10 past 7, um, you know, as they said, they, they put a very quick announcement up because I, I posted on to, on to, onto the social media around, has anybody else seen this? And then mm. there'll be, the statement came back from the company. Yes, it's, you know, everyone's fine. Um, just just, a, just a, a very bizarre event, right? You can see, yeah. you know, those things are, we, we take our dog for a walk very close to those. I mean, they, 
they are huge. And when I, you know, when when you see the extent of actually what's gone, it's 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 quite horrific, really. And I think people were still being kept away from that area this morning, and we can still see the smoke rising there. Clearly, they were a bit worried about you know what sort of gases and other things would have been emanating from that. Yeah, I think it was only biofuels. I don't think there was anything particularly scared. No one was coming out and evacuating the village, that was mm. for sure. So, um, you know, any excuse to be locked into the local pub, I'm sure, but it didn't, didn't happen. You sound disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, we've got to take you to the pub and lock you in there. For the oh, really? That's such a shame. <laughs> yeah. So have, have you actually got your own video of this now that, you know, you'll be paying for your, your sort of grandkids and, and so on in, in years to come? Do you know what? How stupid am I? So I walk outside. I, you know, in the excitement, I take one single picture because you know, like I'm, I'm actually, I'm obviously I look in, live in the real event. You know, I don't. I'm not one of these people that goes to a concert and videos. It. I actually watch it, and um, so therefore I do. Oh, oh, I think we, we've lost you. But uh, thank you very much, Stuart, for updating us with uh, your eyewitness reports. And as uh, Pip says, glad to uh, report no one injured, but uh, clearly a huge event, which they're, they're still coping with in terms of damping down and yeah, cleaning up. Absolutely incredible. Well, thank you for your company this afternoon on the live desk. That is it from us for today. There will, of course, be more next from the Tory party conference, but we will speak to you tomorrow. Bye -bye. Yeah, HS two and a half tomorrow. Who knows? We shall see. Hello. It's a blustery, showery day. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. I'm Alex Burkill. If we start off looking at the bigger picture and there is an area of low pressure just to the north of the UK and tightly packed isobars indicate that it is going to be quite windy, breezy for many of us. Meanwhile, high pressure is building from the south and that is going to quieten our weather down across southern parts this week. Through the rest of Tuesday, though, yes, it's breezy and there are plenty of showers around. Some sunny spells in between the showers, but particularly towards the north and west of the UK, those showers could be quite heavy at times and there may be some rumbles of thunder mixed in as well. Temperatures are going to be down a little bit compared to recently. It's going to feel quite fresh at times, especially in those brisk, blustery winds. Through the end of the day, we'll continue to see some showers, particularly across northern and western parts. Some clear skies developing down the east and in the south as well. Meanwhile, as we go through the night, we are going to see a swathe of wet weather pushing its way in from the west, affecting many parts of Scotland. Some heavy rain likely here. Temperatures aren't going to drop a huge amount for many towns and cities, though some rural spots towards the east where we get the clear skies could turn a little chilly. So Wednesday then, a bit of a north-south split, a fairly wet picture across many parts of Scotland, quite cloudy. The rain will be heavy at times and building up with some high totals, particularly for western parts of Scotland. Meanwhile, a drier picture further south, albeit there will be a few showers to watch out for, particularly across parts of Wales and southwest England. Temperatures for many will be similar to today. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 